Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and uh, if this is new to you, please go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu where you'll find all the previous ones organized in various ways. If this is not in new to you, you're probably tired of hearing me saying this every week. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and this, which is that Buddha at the Gas Pump is um, not entirely a labor of love, although I love it, uh, but it depends upon the support of those who also love it or appreciate it and would like to support it. So if you're one such person and would like to contribute to it in any, um, in any amount, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. Okay, um, my guest today is David Buckland, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, I interviewed him about three years ago up in Canada when I went up there to do a retreat with Lauren Huff. And um, I've been a regular reader of his blog since even before that. He has a blog that's at davidia.org. .ca. .ca, because he's Canadian. <laughs> and um, he's a, a really good writer, and, and I always learn from reading his blog posts. And um, so that's something that those listening might want to consider doing, or subscribing to his blog. He writes things usually faster than I can keep up with him, because there are all kinds of other things I need to read. But I always take the time to read them. Um, we covered a lot in David's first interview. And I would recommend that people watch that, uh, even possibly before watching this, or listen to it in any case. Uh, but you, you can also just listen to this one without having watched that, and I think you'll get right into what we're saying. Um, David has had a profound level of experience for many, many decades, and uh, his experience has progressed even in the past three years. I would imagine your understanding as well. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I just wanted to <clears throat> have another interview with him to kind of get up to date on what he's been going through. So, um, let's start. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to start by putting a little context, building a little context, uh, so we know where I'm talking about. Um, so in the last interview, in the first interview, I. Uh, spoke about uh, the witnessing process and the, um, waking up, self-realization, cosmic consciousness, and the process through what's known as God consciousness and unity uh, stages of, uh, of enlightenment, and then into a, a post-consciousness quality of Brahman, known as Brahman, where you go beyond uh, the, the consciousness and all the dynamics of creation and the dynamics of experience. Let's so, unpack that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Witnessing. Okay. So witnessing is is when you shift from being a person experiencing through the senses to being a, a kind of a detached observer, uh, experiencing through the senses, through the mind body as before, but kind of from a, an infinite place instead of from a local place. So you are that infinite place, which is witness, which is sort of perceiving, as it were, through a local instrument. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's the, the, sometimes people have that that begins with self-realization, with waking up, and sometimes it can start beforehand, where the self is woken up to the experiencing or the, the process of experience here, but it has not woken up to itself yet. There's a, there can be a lag sometimes. Let's unpack that a little bit. So what, okay, sure. what's the difference between, if any, between the self and the witness? Well, the witness can be kind of like a localized version of the self. Sometimes the, the word jiva is used. Uh, a jiva can shift into an observer mode. And uh, so it's quality of the self, but it's kind of a localized quality of the self. It's, um, it's like you're, you're looking in through the, through the senses. Uh, but you're not aware of what it is that's, that's experiencing. So you're kind of aware that you're aware, but you're not aware what that is. Well, yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's it's kind of hard to describe exactly. Um, well, let me ask it this way: yeah. uh, Would it be fair to say that witnessing can result from a kind of a more silent level of mind having been yeah. established or enlivened? Yes. And yet that's not the self because it's not fundamental enough to be. The self is just a quieter level, like a, well, like a deeper it, level of the ocean, but not the ocean floor. Yeah, it's the self, but it's the self 
still kind of at a point. And Some the, individuation. The, yeah, the ego is still attached. The ego is still dead. Okay. And so there's kind of this uh, duality there of self. There's the ego being identified, and then there's this observer of the ego being identified. But the observer doesn't know what it is yet. It, it kind of seems like you know what it is, but until you actually wake up, you don't know what it is. Okay. And then when you actually wake up, right. how, how do things shift? So then, then you, you recognize, or the self recognizes itself as the self. And, and, and so there, consciousness has a three-way dynamic. There's the observer, the process of, of, of experience, and the observed, the objects of experience, the, the things in the environment around us. So self-realization is when the observer wakes up to itself. It knows itself as infinite consciousness. Then later on in the unity stage, the, well, it's kind of like there's the experiencer and then the object of experience. You, we wake up to the screen on which the world is playing out. We recognize that, that consciousness underlies the experiences of the world as well as our own experience. And, and to put that more precisely, thing. consciousness itself recognizes that it is the underlying thing. Right, right. Uh, uh, but it doesn't regard the world as that. It sees the world as being something other than that. Well, the world is the play of, of consciousness, play of which is but the it, self. Is it seen as such yes. in that initial stage of witnessing? Yes. Okay, so you see the trees and the birds and everything else as the play of consciousness, but not as consciousness. Well, both. Okay, now you're talking about the unity state? Or yeah, the, unity. Yeah. Okay, unity, yes, yeah, yeah, but yeah, prior yeah. to that, just witnessing. Yeah, no, I jumped into the unity state. You jumped. There. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> you missed that. Stop jumping. <laughs> so, so then you basically, the subject and object are, are one. Yes, okay. And so what's left is the process of experience, the devata value, the, the, uh, the process of, of how the, the world comes to be. Now, someone who hasn't gone through a God consciousness stage, refined perception and that kind of thing, the awakening heart, they may not recognize that process taking place. Uh -huh. they, they, before you wake up, you experience being the doer. I am, these are, you know, these are my actions, I am making these decisions, these are my thoughts, these are my emotions. But after waking up, you experience being the observer. And actually in the witness stage, there's some value of that as well. You, you're the observer of the doing. And so what you had thought was mine before, you now experience this happening essentially on its own. There's some volition thing going on, but it's clearly a different driver than you thought. It's, the ego had kind of claimed those dynamics, but they turned out not to be um, right. mine. They're just The goons happening. of nature are doing yeah. something. And so the, the process of experience part is the process that's creating that. The, the, the data to value, the, the laws of nature that are uh, creating the, the dynamics of experience. Okay, so data creating, means? Uh, essentially, it's a deva means light being, and devata is is kind of a a, a point value. It doesn't have an expression as a, a form value. It's simply like a point of intelligence that uh, is acting. Okay. So, nature. are you saying that light beings or devatas are somehow instrumental in the conductance of of the world and of experience? Yeah, they're, they're the actual doers, if, if that can be said. And what are these light beings? They're, they're impulses of, of intelligence, uh, impulses of, of divinity, uh, they're the laws of nature. Now there's, there's a, a point worth making in there. Uh, we can experience the world, uh, the function of the world in two primary kind of ways. One of them is with the intellect. And from the perspective of the intellect, we experience laws of nature functioning. We, we experience principles functioning in the world. We, we, like we see... Gravity. And yeah, yeah, we see these principles happening. But from, from a heart-based perspective, with refined perception, we can experience those same laws of nature as personified, mm -hmm. as beings. Uh, and beings interacting and having relationships. They work in teams and... and um, uh, communities, whatever like that, and yeah, it's, it's, okay, uh, yeah. And since this kind of stuff is not necessarily talked about that much in spiritual circles, I just mm -hmm. want to dwell on it a little bit, because okay, yeah. rather than just zip, zip through things. Sure. Um, so what you're saying, uh, I think, is that if we had the eyes to see it, underneath the surface level of apparent appearances in the world, uh, there are all sorts of intelligent 
beings who are beings every, much, every bit as much as you and I are, right. who have their own autonomous existence and perhaps some kind of subtle bodies, right. um, and they, are, they have roles to play. Functions to serve. Yeah, it, it, one of the things they talk about in different traditions is kind of the layers of, of becoming, how, how you get from consciousness into form, into mm -hmm. solid, the solid world. And there are several different models. I'm going to be doing a talk at San in a couple of days on the koshas, the, or sheets, the, the seven layers from the, between uh, consciousness becoming into physical matter. And so there's these kind of seven people call it planes or dimensions, uh, but essentially there's layers of expression that are progressively more um, dense, more... Uh, Material? Uh, yeah, they, they, so, so you go through, um, there's the bliss body and the, the intellect intuition uh, level and the, the mental body they call it and the emotional body and, and then the physical body and it's kind of and they have various characteristics and so on like that that's a whole other conversation but th there's essentially these layers of increasing densification and there is life the, the world is full of life on all those levels there, there's all kinds of right. types of beings and with different functions and, and so on and so most people's perception is limited to a certain strata or a certain yeah. certain portion of that full strata yeah. and other people have a broader range of perspective and they, yeah. they see these subtler beings as routinely as yeah. other people see birds and dogs yeah. And, yeah there's people I know who routinely work with with subtle beings to for uh, healing for example uh -huh. or for uh, getting certain things done in the world yeah. Uh, a friend of mine's working on uh, creating peace in Washington, D.C. Huh. using subtle beings. Yeah. Oh, there's but, subtle uh, beings in Washington, D.C. of <laughs> all places? Wow, yeah. they all seem kind of gross to me. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, there's... Uh, well, go ahead, I'll continue. Yeah, well, that's, that's so basically, there's life everywhere. And so there's yeah. th th these beings, as I understand it, um, and I'm just sort of giving you seed thoughts to elaborate on, mm -hmm. um, have kind of a hierarchical arrangement. Or yeah. perhaps we could say concentric circles of influence where some are smaller spheres of influence, others are larger, incorporating those smaller spheres and on and on out. Just yeah. the way we have like, you know, planets, solar system, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and so on. Yeah, yeah, they, they work in hierarchies. Uh, most light beings have, have uh, defined roles. Um, they're able to easily fulfill their desires, uh, enjoy, you know, enjoy their being, their doing. Uh -huh. uh, it's quite a different, we're, we're here uh, as humans, we have this uh, ability to experience choice and free will. Uh -huh. it's, um, it's, very, it's kind of a perspective, because uh, it's free will and determinism are, are kind of really two sides of one coin, but again, that's a whole other <laughs> topic. Conversation. But, but we get to have this experience of, uh, of choice and free will, and get to choose to uh, work in, in harmony with with life and and uh, or not. Or not. And, and, yeah, we we're just talking about that in the previous interview. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it's, it's it's quite a different experience than than they have. And how do you know all this? Have you experienced these beings yourself, or yes. is this like reading books? Yeah. Um, I no. I no. A lot of that stuff isn't in books that I've seen. Um, no, I've been experiencing this since my late teens. Uh, mm -hmm. wasn't something I was looking for. And, and <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know about this. <laughs> I first started showing up. But, you know, it's progressed since then. And um, I don't spend a lot of time with that stuff, but, uh -huh. but it's, just, it's just there. Yeah. And I suppose the reason we're talking about it is it's, I don't know, I think that it, as anyone who's interested in spirituality as part of that, perhaps might want to have an understanding of how creation actually works. Exactly. It can be handy. Yeah, and, and there's, once we know how creation works, then we're much more uh, readily able to work with it and, yeah. uh, and do things that perhaps we, the science hasn't discovered yet. So. Yeah. And also, I mean, I've seen people who are into spirituality for, you know, to, and have had significant awakenings even, mm -hmm. whose understanding, in my opinion, is somewhat limited or restricted. For instance, they might glom onto the notion that ultimately there is no self. And then they might 
deduce from that that since there is no personal self, there couldn't possibly be anything after the body dies. There couldn't because that would imply some kind of self that would yeah. continue. Yes. There, there couldn't be reincarnation. Well, and well if you think of if you think of those layers, you know, we have this physical body and that, and essentially what happens when we die is we drop the the, the, the lower parts, the lower stuff, yeah. but we just move up basically. Right, the higher stuff fall. doesn't. Yeah. Just keeps yeah. on keeping keeps on. on going. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so uh, that was meant to be some unpacking. I don't want to throw you off track. Yeah. yeah. We were supposed to kind of just do a brief thing, but yeah, you're right. It. It. Uh, some context is good. Yeah. So uh, and also in the in the unity stage, there's a essentially a process of experiencing just by living life. You experience something, and oh, that is the self. That is myself and that is myself, and that is myself. And it kind of progresses through all the layers of experience and into memory and, and past and future and all this stuff. And so one of the little things in that is that because everything comes out of the consciousness and you are that, you're able to have the experience of just about anything. So uh, for example, you can see what it is to be a tree. Or, or uh -huh. cat. Or, you mean you can kind of tune a into a the life of a tree to such an extent that you know what it's like to. Yeah, be uh, yeah. Done? From a broader perspective, in, in unity, you recognize that consciousness is aware of itself globally and at every point, and the value that's that's experiencing through this body is one of those points. And it's a simple matter of moving in consciousness to experience what it is from a different point. Huh. However, that's that's is. Of course, you're still and, embodied in this body. Yeah, this is kind of like the default, and it, yeah. it always comes back here. But uh, but you can, it's, you can kind of bit. you know put your attention on it. Now there is you know a caveat in that because um, you're you're experiencing it from how your consciousness is, not not from how their consciousness right. is. So they're, they're they have filters that that you'll you'll recognize, but but if they're not you know if the cat isn't awake, then the cat, you're not going to be, you'll experience the cat's experience to a degree, but not exactly the yeah. same. Yeah, so you get flavors, of, pretty good yeah, flavors, flavors of it. Yeah, so you get a sense of what it is to be these various things. Huh. And so the Why would you want to do that? Like, from like, well, it just gives you a sense of what it's like. Curiosity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So I did a little of that. Like, why would you want to watch a movie or something? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's so, fun. So it's interesting <laughs> to find out, you know, what it is to be different things. Yeah. But yeah, it's not, you know, so it's something I just did a little bit of, just hmm. out of curiosity, like you say. Yeah. And uh, okay, so in, in the last interview, uh, we talked a little bit about Brahman, and essentially, Brahman is beyond consciousness, beyond that process of experience. So it's beyond even the, the process of experience and the devata value and all that kind of stuff. It's simply Brahman, and it, it, Brahman can't be experienced because it's beyond consciousness, and so you you know it by being it. Brahman knows itself. And Brahman, in, in a sense, is the, the, they talk about being the devourer because you have the experience, and, and it's kind of like in unity, you recognize, oh, that's consciousness, or that consciousness. But in this case, it's more, it just absorbs everything. Let me ask you a question about Brahman. A lot of times people talk, they say, okay, consciousness is the fundamental reality of the universe. Everything is consciousness interacting with itself and so right. on and so forth. Um, it's the ultimate constituent. Right, that's true in self-realization and unity. So it's not ultimately true as far as the ultimate yeah, but what is ultimately big yeah, enchilada yeah, reality of yeah. the universe. Yeah, there's the, there's the Kala model, for example, that, that, that rates uh, levels of development mm -hmm. in India, and they have 16 Kalas. Kalas, yeah. Krishna is a, given in this example of 16. Uh -huh. Humans can make something like eight or nine. One through eight or something like that. Yeah, four yeah. through eight or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So we're essentially um, somewhere between animals and and, and uh, high beings, and, right. and uh, but where we can get about halfway, essentially. <laughs> so, so what ultimate reality? You know, I don't know if that's even possible. Yeah, for human but I mean, form, it's but. well, but that's slightly a different point because reality should be reality irrespective of who experiences it. It's, it, it's reality is not sort of beho beholden to us right, right. to uh, understand it in order for it to be what it is. Right. Well, we'll I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more shortly because one of the things that what's experiencing now is that that there is a value that this physiology isn't capable of knowing at all. It, it's just beyond. Right. And I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. But but it's. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, in, in uh, God consciousness is essentially a refined form of cosmic consciousness or, or self-realization. Then there's a refined form of unity, and that's where you get into this. What I was talking about consciousness being being um, 
uh, aware of itself globally and at every point, and uh, that be able to, you know, to, to see this, those dynamics, to perceive those dynamics. Um, that's a part of the refined aspect. And uh, ultimately, at the top, at the top of uh, unity stage is what's uh, commonly called God realization. And at the top of unity. Stage. Yeah, and, and that's what basically it's, it's when we ultimately unite with the divine. Okay, so you're so, so. distinguishing God consciousness from God realization. Yes. Okay. Realization, in the sense, in the terminology like self-realization, is when we realize we are the self, mm -hmm. or become the self, uh, or you want to work. So God realization be when we realize we are God. Yeah, but it not just know that I'm I'm God, but we become God. So because before we, that we do we become something we actually weren't already. And, well, we or, were, or but, do but we, count, we we finally get to know who we actually always have been. Yeah. Or what? Well, yes, it's it is that. But uh, before that, there can be the experience that oh, I'm God also. You know, uh, and, and even in, in God consciousness, there can be a quality of that. I remember, um, you know, a friend joking about this. He was having that experience, and he said, like, "I'm God. You're not. I'm way ahead of you." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but with God realization, you, there's the, the becoming, and um, that can, uh, it was here, and, and uh, like a few other people I know, uh, that can be the doorway into Brahman. Because once you become God, you're, you're, you, you step out of consciousness. And it's kind of like consciousness is aware of itself globally, and, and at every point, there's nothing more to be aware of, it, of itself, and then it turns and looks beyond itself. Because it's always been looking in on itself up until that point. And then it can look beyond itself, and then it recognizes Brahman. <laughs> now, Brahman, Brahman can be said to be conscious, but not consciousness, because it's not flowing and um, moving. It's, it just, so it, it knows itself. Yeah, well, I mean, what do you say about it? I mean, the, the words like nothing is often used. Uh, emptiness, void, those kind of words that don't really quite work, because that's kind of a description of the space of open consciousness as a quality in when you're looking at consciousness in a large way. Sometimes that's described as a void or a, a, an emptiness because it's just big open space. Let me ask you this, and while I do, you can repin your microphone, which just fell oh, down. Okay. Um, and that is, um, you're using a lot of terminology, you know, right. witnessing, God consciousness, yeah, unity, yeah. Brahman. Um, and do this so that the mic itself is not tucked under your shirt. Okay, um, maybe I should do it on the side. Yeah, do it on the other side. Okay. And um, so, so my question is, um, rumble, rumble. to what extent can you make this sort of more vividly clear for people, like what it's actually like to experience this, that, or the other thing, rather than just throwing terms at them? <laughs> and I realize that's a tall order. Okay, okay. I mean, well, we okay. had a cold conversation in yeah. the previous interview well, about what, what it's, it's like to experience Brahman. Well, it's, 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 you're not experiencing anything. It, it, but it's, it's interesting because you're also still, I can recall when the, when the shift was going on, the, it's like I'm, I'm looking at things and I know that the world, from that perspective, nothing has ever been created mm -hmm. and it, or ever will be. It's, un, it's, it's the uncreated. Mm -hmm. And yet, there it is, mm -hmm. right, right in front of my, you know, yeah. and, and it changes because it's, because before that you're experiencing the world from a perspective of consciousness, now you're experiencing the world from the perspective of Brahman, and it's kind of, it's, and it's not like the world is an illusion, because it's, it's an expression of consciousness, and consciousness isn't an illusion. It's, what the illusion part is when you don't recognize the source, when you're just seeing the surface appearance, you have the, the, that is seen as an illusion. So people talk about the world as an illusion, but what it is, it's the surface value that's seen as an illusion. When you go more deeply, you see that it's, it, it's an illusion in the sense of the surface value, but when you see its source, that's not an illusion, that's part of the dynamics. Okay, we're kind of jumping around here. Well, could you, but, but it's, yeah, I hope yeah. I'm not throwing you off the track, but I'm just yeah. trying to get you to clarify these terms as yeah. we go along. Right, and, right. And so when you say that it's an illusion because you're not perceiving the source, would another way of saying that be to say that it deserves the term illusion because you're just so underappreciating it? It's like you're well, just yeah. getting just a faint smudge of what it really is. Right, right, exactly. And when you see it as the play of the divine or, or however that, how you might frame that, then you recognize that it's not an illusion in the bigger picture. It's just an illusion when we see it only on the surface. When we see the, the deeper dynamics, then we recognize that it's not... 
it's an appearance, but it's not exactly an illusion. It's not yeah. a mirage, put it that way. It's an appearance of the divine play, and which is not a, a folly or, or a mirage. Now, would it be fair to say that it's an illusion in the sense that, um, I mean, well, you said a minute ago, in Brahman, you, you get the experience that nothing ever happened, that right. the thing never manifested. Right, but, it's not an, but then it's not an illusion. It's, it's like, well, the way, the way I described it um, to Lauren, which he concurred with at the time, was that it's like the divine has this brief musing, this brief thought, and, and that's it. Nothing else happens. There's just this kind of idea. And that's the universe? How, but, but consciousness then takes that idea and turns it into a whole thing. But, it, but it's not really there, or, or it was never expressed or created. It was just essentially an expansion of a divine idea. But then consciousness runs with it and yeah. turns it into a whole well, thing. Well, Shiva, essentially. Shiva being consciousness. Yeah. Okay, so the divine... Uh, we're yeah. going to use terms, we have to define them. Right. So the divine has a brief idea, and then Shiva runs with it and, and goes wild and elaborates Well, it. that's kind of like an attempt to, to know the divine by, by reflecting that thought. Okay, and how does the divine um, distinguish from Shiva? What are the... Well, that that's gets a little further along, but, okay, but yeah, let's keep going. We're getting there. We're getting there. So, so we're kind of like this is kind of the, supposed to <laughs> supposedly the preamble. Oh, this is we're still in the preamble. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because yeah, this is the stuff we talked about to some degree on that. What program. is it with your mic? It keeps slipping down. That. There. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, maybe you're tugging on the wire. Oh, I think that's yeah, it. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Caught it under my leg. Okay. Right. Um, so what's unfolded since the last interview? is there's another layer um, known as para-Brahman. Para meaning beyond. Beyond, yeah, so beyond or greater than. And essentially, it's also known as pure divinity. Now, the best way to think about that is the analogy of pure consciousness. So we have the experience of being aware of our thoughts, being aware of our emotions, blah, blah, blah. and then when we meditate, we, and we settle down deeper and deeper level, and then we have experience of samadhi, or pure consciousness, mm -hmm. just, just awareness by itself. There's no content. So pure divinity is kind of the equivalent of that in a certain kind of way, only uh, it's, well, it's described as the source of the source. It's the, uh, the actual reality <laughs> from that perspective. Um, it's, yeah, and again, pure divinity can only be known by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the experience here was that there was a, a sense of it, of something more than Brahman, but no way of knowing it until it essentially started to pour in. Mm -hmm. And so the, the experience was like um, this white light pouring into the body and and gradually filling it up mm -hmm. from kind of pouring into the down to the, the, the hip area and then gradually uh, filling it up. Somebody else and, told me that recently in an interview. I forget who it was, but he talked about just filling up with light as if a, a yeah. vessel was being filled. Well, this was, yeah, this was very specific though. Yeah. And, and then when that had happened, then, then it, it, it could be known. And it's, it's, it's very difficult to put into words. Uh, for example, there's kind of seven stages of it, which correlates to the seven chakras and the seven koshas and, the, you know, various things, uh, because as above, so below. Seven but, stages of this filling up with light thing? Yeah, uh, and, and, and of the way pure divinity is. And yet there is no, I mean, it's one, but it's kind of seven, I don't know, it's hard to describe. So you found yourself going through seven transitions or something. Yeah, and the, the second, for example, was this profoundly networked, like the, the, the self-knowing that's there, with far beyond anything in consciousness, and even in global consciousness. It just, it's just so uh, networked, like the shaktis, that it's all... Infinitely correlated. Yeah, infinitely correlated, that's a good way to put it. And it's just, uh, just profoundly networked and self-knowing. Within, on, on, on within what? Level. Networked within, within, within what range? Itself. Within the entire like net of Indra kind of thing, where each point is infinitely correlated with every other point? 
Uh, Note of injury is, is further along, or is more expressed. That's okay. kind of more dynamic like on the bliss body. Jumping the gun. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it, but it's quite a bit. But, but, it's, but it's like, you could say injury is net is a reflection of that. Okay. Yeah. And it's like Shakti's, uh, you know, because there's the experience of the Shakti's are out moving through what and motivating. What are the Shakti's? Well, they're kind of like uh, threads or sutras of divinity that, that move through the appearance of consciousness and and drive it. Are they like the devatas we were talking about earlier, or separate, different things? Uh, they're, the the devatas are driven by that. Um, There's like an interrogation. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's yeah. I'm trying <laughs> to are you on the right of the third And then kind of go, goes. And so for me, that kind of it filled up to about here uh -huh. in stages that correlated with the chakras. And then there was kind of a second thing where it it. it it was top down mm -hmm. and came down kind to the heart. In the middle. Yeah, and there's been a couple of similar things in consciousness, so it kind of seems to be a reflection of that. Hmm. So, um, and and it's interesting because one of the one of the okay, one of the things that defines the age we're in, the the large in the large cycles of time, that determine group consciousness, uh, whether we're in a golden age or a uh, Silver Age and so on like that is the number of laws of nature that we were talking about before who are awake. Awake. Uh -huh. And now awake here, I mean in terms of versus sleep, <laughs> because in in darker times, uh, a lot of the laws of nature essentially go dormant and, and yeah. slumber. And so, in as we're in a rising age, uh, laws of nature start waking up. Now, when we say and, laws of nature, are we equating that with devata? Yes, yeah, and, and so devata, we're saying that they're yeah. these subtle beings or impulses of intelligence who serve certain functions, yeah. and they have kind of gone dormant yeah. in a certain age, and they're not maybe doing their jobs. They aren't doing anything, yeah. Okay, yeah. and, and so things that, could be a lot better if closed. they were all on board. Yeah, that factory is closed kind of thing. Okay. And, and they're, they work in teams, like I mentioned. So what I've been observing over the last four or five years is new laws of nature waking up. Everywhere. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, they're fundamental, so it's, it's effectively uh -huh. everywhere. They're fundamental things. And then uh, once they're awake and functioning, then they integrate with other existing awake laws okay. and create new synthesis and stuff. Yeah. And so there's a potential for new laws to be discovered for... By uh, humans? Yeah. yeah. And for uh, laws of nature that, we're, we're, that we would define in science to change mm -hmm. or to uh, evolve, you know, shift in certain ways or certain or to actually function differently or to function a little differently or to have to gain new features mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that particularly um, but but I am noticing these laws of nature wake up yeah now the reason I mentioned it, oh, go ahead okay well, the reason I mentioned yeah. this is because there's a new thing that's happening now uh -huh. that's this is quite recent um, because because the physiology now in, is embodying divinity, the devas that function, okay, I'm just a sec, this, I'm not, I got to back up slightly. Okay, there's like multiple layers to the body, like I mentioned about the koshas, uh, but there's also kind of dominant layers. There's kind of like divine body, although it's not really the body, there's the cosmic body. Uh, which functions inside creation and outside outside our universe. It's kind of more universal, and then um, so it's before the bliss body, and um, and then there's the 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 la kind of layers down the devata body and that into our individual forms. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that happens through the refined stages is there's a shifting up in those layers. So in in um, uh, in the later part of unity. You become aware. You become the cosmic body. You, you're basically you. You. Um, uh, you're functioning kind of in the universal body as well. So you're purifying not only in your own physiology. You're purifying in the collective. It's kind of like a collective or shared body. You're helping the collective purify. Yeah. By yeah. purifying and, and, your and, aspect or your experience of. of and yeah, and and cosmic. wake up. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a process where, you know, for a while, for example, uh, you know, I would kind of, you know, I, I, there's a blog post where I would talk about this, where I'm walking down the road, I'm getting some groceries or whatever, and simultaneously, I'm um, the cosmic body going around and, and purifying things. And, and you're aware of yourself doing that both, as yeah. the cosmic body. Yeah, and then later on it kind of shifted and they became one thing. So there's the local and there's the cosmic, but they're not, they're not two different things, it's just one thing. 
Yeah. Uh, but it, they're they're functioning on multiple levels. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And so, so, <laughs> so now it's kind of the, now it's kind of like there's the divine thing going on. Because we know we're we're always using the term multidimensional. We're multidimensional beings and all that. So you're just kind of um, elaborating on our multidimensionality. What, yeah. what that really means. Yeah. And so because there's this divinity being embodied here now, what's the the new thing that's happening is that the devas that are part of the functionality of this body and the and the cosmic, cosmic body, body and that are waking up in the enlightenment sense. Yeah. Okay. So, before, so they themselves are becoming enlightened. Or? Yeah, because they're functioning in the in the, inside divinity. So they know themselves as expressions of divinity, but they don't. They're not. They're not awake to their reality as divinity. Okay. And so it's kind of like a different form of enlightenment they have. Yeah. But what what, it's, what I'm seeing happening is they're waking up. In, it's kind of like. They're, they have a universal nature, and then they express up into various forms. Yeah, so they have these kind of like aspects, or like fingers, I don't know how you Functions. want to put it, or hairs, whatever. And they're kind of like, there's, that aspect is, is active in this body, or that body, or that body, so yeah. on. And, um, and so what what's happening is they're in this, and so they're waking up to it in that aspect that's here, and then that shifts back into their universal nature, and it kind of it, it falls back, and so there's there's a a, a larger scale awakening uh -huh. uh, that takes place, and then that moves forward into all the aspects. So what you're saying so is it's another mechanic that's for for global consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're saying that there are devatas that function within our bodies, yeah, as well as within the co cosmic body, yeah, and these devatas I'm in furring are not exclusive to our body, like you right. and I might have the same devatas functioning in both of our bodies, uh, yes. right? We don't have the right. David devatas and the Rick devatas, we have right. the same devatas functioning in everybody's bodies or... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so when... Well, there are some that are, that are Rick specific and then there's some that are more progressively more, more universal as you get more... As you go deeper in the koshas, you get progressively yeah. more universal. So the devatas that function in everyone's body yeah. Kind of like multitasking universe. Well, these are Deva. chakra devas. Chakra devas. Uh, and so what, let's try to put this in plain English. So there are certain <coughs> beings, yeah. subtle beings, impulses of intelligence, whose role or function is to reside in some sense within everyone's body, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps at various chakras. Yeah. And you're saying that they or maybe those are the ones you're referring to, are waking up in a, in a new way, get kind of... Well, they're becoming enlightened in the deva way. They're becoming yeah. enlightened as devas, become, uh, in a way that a deva would become enlightened. Yeah. Yeah. And the significance of that is that if they are in everyone's body, and they're becoming enlightened by virtue of certain people getting enlightened, perhaps that's the reason, and yeah. helping them to get enlightened, yeah. then they're getting enlightened in, you know, everybody in, in Syria and, yeah. and every place. And yeah. No, that, of course, there's, there is going to be a time process in here, though, because if they're awakening here, like I say, it has to fall back into their universal nature and wake up in that bigger way, uh -huh. and then it can move forward into all the aspects. Yeah. That. But it's... But it's to me, it's really interesting because it's 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 like a whole different level of yeah, it's movement. Very it's not just a bunch of individual humans that are helping raise group consciousness, but right. it's like you know all the levels kind of coming on board. It also puts uh, more kind of richness into the explanation of collective consciousness because usually we think of collective consciousness as being like this homogeneous, amorphous field, right. like and and the field is somehow getting enlivened by people waking up in the world and that enlivenment is benefiting everyone just as if the ground in a forest became more nutrient rich all the trees would benefit yeah. but what you're saying is this field is not just plain vanilla amorphous homogeneous <laughs> consciousness or something yeah. it's actually lively with impulses of intelligence yeah. which serve functions within it yeah. and those impulses of intelligence in this that and the other physiology yeah. are waking up and are better able to perform those functions. Yeah, when you first wake up uh, in self-realization, it's, it's an awakening uh, to the silence, to yes. the silence of consciousness. Right. But the, the next step is for that silence, or to, is to wake up to the liveliness of that silence. The dynamics of the Because dynamics that, and, yeah. it's, it's both silent and alive. Right. And it's, actually, if you look at the actual 
becoming of consciousness itself, and again, this is from a Brahman perspective, there is these aspects of alertness, liveliness, and intelligence in Brahman that, and essentially the, the liveliness stirs alertness mm -hmm. and it becomes conscious. And then that consciousness begins to move, flows, and it curves back on itself. And then it becomes intelligent? Yeah, and the intel well, because it, it's not just sounds agitating, like, sounds agitating like the alertness. Less than eight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's, um, so it's not just, uh, <laughs> it's not just, it's not, because the alertness isn't just, I mean, the liveliness isn't just agitating the alertness. It, there's some intelligence behind that. Yes. And so it, it flows, curves back on itself, becomes self-aware, and the dynamics of consciousness begin. Yeah. And then it kind of curves in on itself again, and then again. And, Agitation and so implies, implies chaos. And, and yeah. what, what you're, what you're talking about There's a liveliness, but there's an intelligence. And it has a direction. And, and yeah, there's, orderliness. There's, there's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Huh. Interesting. Um, yeah, and another interesting dynamic that's that's interesting to share that that's become that's been developing a little while. One of the 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 on the there's the bliss body, and then the next one up is known as the intellect body, but it's also the level of very fine feelings and um, intuition, that kind of thing. It's a level where the fine vibrations of on the bliss body, the uh, you know the primordial sound, om, you know whatever. Um, uh, starts to differentiate and it takes on structure, what people would call sacred geometry, mm -hmm. whatever. There's, there's kind of relationships and dynamics going on, creates a structure, and then in the mental body it, it, it gains a field and that, that goes forward into forms and so on. Um, but the interesting thing, you know, I was looking at this geometry, why does geometry come out of space? There's kind of the, the, the dynamics of, because consciousness curves back on itself, it creates a subtle space. Because it's you know you've got consciousness, subject and object, and there's a space in here, uh -huh. and that and that's the that when it takes the the next collapse, it becomes a little more dense, becomes the actual element of space. But why would that space then gain a geometry? And that turns out to be because uh, the devata work in teams, as I mentioned, and it's kind of when there's a space formed, the the surface of the space has this dynamic of devata, and they kind of, uh, they talk to, they talk to, sing to each other, mm -hmm. they call it the say, and they, they create specific, we relate to Sanskrit as the, those subtle sounds of the devata, but they don't, they don't use words in a sequence the way we would, we would speak a, a Sanskrit verses, they, they do harmonies and um, they speak together at the simultaneously, and it creates these um, reverberations, uh, and it creates relationship between them. So you get this subtle structure, and you get uh, directed, <laughs> the directed vibration, and and that and then that that structures the fields which uh, structure form. So I was hanging on for dear life to understand that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think what you're saying, I often do this in interviews, I try to restate what the person said to see if right, I got right. it right, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think what you're saying is that um, you're talking about a universal process through which manif manifestation takes place. Right. And um, I'm talking about why it's a geometry, though, as opposed to just you know, vibrations in a field. Well, vibrations. What, what gives it structure? Yeah, what gives it structure? Um, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit in, in my interview with Sean Webb. But you know, why should all this structure and orderliness come out of chaos? Come out of you know homogeneous hydrogen? And and yeah. why why did stars form? Why did stars explode, forming heavy elements? Why did heavy elements accrete into planets and to into bodies? And yeah. and why did those bodies evolve? Why is all this evolutionary? Right. trajectory taking place. Exactly, because of the basic laws of physics, like you know, second law of third dynamics. Second law would say break like, it all down to... Yeah, to, it, yeah. You know, it's all going to turn into entropy, into yeah. dust. Yeah. So where did all the negative entropy come from? And I think you're saying it's coming from these... Well, these, the orderliness, because the, not, not only is the universe... Did, did the universe uh, form planets and stars and, and that kind of thing, which wouldn't have happened if it was pure entropy, uh, but it's evolved into supporting life forms and all this kind of yeah. thing, however you want to see the history of the universe. And which is really so hard to explain it, it, if you think that the universe is just sort of a random, machine. you know, and, and, you know, unintelligent 
mechanistic thing. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense There has to be, not only there has, just to keep it going without falling apart, there has to be a constant input of order. Of order. And to make it grow and evolve, and, and you have to yeah. add even more. Yeah. yeah, and I imagine there'll be some scientists talking about that at the SAND conference, but I don't know how they explain it. And but you're explaining it in terms of devatas, sort of... As an um, expression of that yeah. sort of intelligence. Yeah. So it's almost like the devatas, if we're still using the right term by using that one, uh, their role is to... Um, they're almost like Santa's elves or something. They're, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind of taking... Um, you know, f the field of pure potentiality and st and molding it or shaping it into orderly structures, and those orderly structures become more and more uh, elaborate and yeah. and complex. As and, and some of them just come up to the level of a thought, and we have a thought. Uh -huh. And some of them come up to the level of an emotion, and you know whatever, yeah. or uh, an energy phenomenon, or electricity. Um, and then some of them come all the way into a physical form. Right, and the physical forms are incredibly complex. Yeah. I mean, look at a single cell. It's like mind-bogglingly yeah. Yeah. complex. Yeah. And we have you know, trillions of them in our yeah. bodies, yeah. and they're all coordinating with each other. Yeah, <laughs> and then, I've, you know, I've been reading a little bit about DNA and stuff, and it's fascinating, because now they're, they're you know, mitochondrial DNA, they can, uh, they can trace back the mother's line, and if you're uh, a male, the Y DNA, you can trace back the father's line for you know, 100,000 years. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Solves crimes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, Anyways. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's, I don't know, maybe we see how much we can squeeze out of this one point, but um, I'm always awestruck by the, um, the beauty and complexity of creation. And I'm always pondering, you know, what might be the mechanics through which this takes place. And it's one thing to just sort of say, okay, God did it, or, you know, it's all divine <laughs> intelligence, but it's really interesting to go into the fine mechanics yeah. Of how yeah. God does it, and, with, yeah, and, 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 and again I, with Santa's helpers. And I, I, I have a great deal of gratitude for for getting these insights because it's not because this isn't coming from a me uh, yeah, yeah. doing something or or uh, accomplishing anything. It's 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 just essentially, uh, I guess, some kind of dharmic. Yeah, uh, it's plot. your role like, to play. Yeah, uh -huh. and I'm called to write about it. So yeah, yeah. Huh. Oh, I do. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Oh, I did yeah. want to mention, uh, rolling back slightly, when I was talking about the, these devata waking up, or the devas in the body, the chakra devas waking up, um, one of the things, the impetus of that uh, was in the summer, uh, Lauren Lucia Hoff, you mentioned early, Lauren earlier, Mm -hmm. uh, introduced what they refer to as the Divine Sutras. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's essentially a two-part. So one is uh, Sanyama from, from the yoga. From, from yoga. Patanjali. Yeah, but it's uh, when people are awake, they can, they can place, they can place, uh, they can use Sanyama much more direct, more, much more precisely. Mm -hmm. It's not just, a, you know, dropping it into the and you know, throwing it into the lake, you can actually put it in a precise point. Mm -hmm. And so uh, an upgrade to the Sanyama technique so that you're able to place it. And then the Divine Sutras, which... Uh, okay, wait, hang on. Okay. So unless somebody has done the TM City program, they probably don't know what the Sanyama technique is. Okay, so you right. better describe that a little bit. Okay, let's see if I remember. It's essentially, uh, Sanyama, it, it talks, yeah, talk, the Yoga Sutra, there, there's gazillions of versions of that out there. It's essentially a technique that combines San, uh, samadhi, that Down pure consciousness. Samadhi. Yeah, and so essentially, it's when you when you're established enough from your practice to be able to stay in samadhi without being bumped. You know, be able to have a thought while you're in samadhi. So that then you're able to uh, add an, and have an intention. So a, sp a specific intention or a specific focus, and uh, and then the third book in the Yoga Sutra then describes a whole series of. Uh, different things you can do with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowledge of past lives, invisibility, flying right. through the air, all that yeah. kind of thing. None yeah. of which we've seen anybody accomplish yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I've, I've, yeah, anyways, some people have known their past lives. But, that part, uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe some of the more subjective ones they say they've accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so this is applying applying that technique, but to uh, with to, more precision or something to a quality of the divine mother, oh. so of the pure divinity, uh -huh. and and uh, so I started doing that this summer, and that's really kicked it up. Huh. Essentially, it's kind of um, 
uh, enlivened the, the the divinity in a way that that uh, be, you know it was a, it was becoming embodied here, but that kind of enlivened it a lot more, hmm. and so that's that's helping to that okay. seems to be the cause of of them starting to wake up. So Lauren and Lucy are teaching those. Yeah, they started to teach them. Okay. Uh, another friend of mine has had a similar experience. Different kind of Deva woke up, but uh, huh. different type, but similar kind of thing going on. Is there actual, do you actually communicate with these Devas? Like, you know, mm -hmm. they say, hey, David, how's it going? And you say... Well, not in that kind of level, but there's... there's <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, I'm being facetious. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's kind of interesting, because right now, before there was the experience of being awake and having, you know, various... If I put my attention on it, most of the time I'm just doing usual stuff. I'm not paying attention to this stuff. But if I put my attention on it, oh yeah, there's this, these, these David Tai interacting this way over here, and this is going on, and I know I ate too much, or you know whatever else is going on. You know? um, but the um, but now there's multiple points of awakeness here, so isn't, there isn't just kind of the default experience of being awake. Now there's there's other points that are experiencing being awake. In a different way. Those devatas. Yeah. Who are, who are, yeah. yeah. So, just so just just to use a metaphor, maybe. So okay. just as you know, we're a conglomeration of trillions of cells, many of which aren't human. All the bio, uh, the microbiome, and all that stuff. Uh -huh. um, you're saying that um, part of our makeup is these devatas or impulses of intelligence, which have a life just as a cell has a life um, of its own, and uh, yeah. these things have lives of their own, and they're, they're part and parcel of our makeup, and they might not be exclusively within, within us, we've already established yeah. that, they might right. have a broad, broader life, mm -hmm. just as, you know, molecules we breathe, or others yeah. breathe. And, well, it's kind of a hierarchy there too, because there's the, the ones that are more universal, and then there's the kind of the yeah. progressively more uh, expressed, and then they're more and more local. So maybe well. some are exclusively ours, and yeah, others yeah. are more. Yeah, but the big ones are, are universal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and where was I going with this? So they're waking up, and um, what, what were you just saying that made me go off on this tangent? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me to remember something? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking. Well, yeah, anyway. Well, let's just keep going, and it'll, it'll come okay. to me. Okay. Um, but there was something I was getting at. There was a subtle kind of question here about, um, maybe it was about communicating with them. Oh, yeah, about and, communicating, and yeah. yeah. So, so there's an interaction. There's that whole thing in the Gita on. about you like, support the gods and they support you. I wonder if yeah. that's what this Well, that, that's part of this, to. yeah, on a different level. But yes, yeah, it's, it's both ways. Um, but there's you know, the various dynamics going on, like... like um, I can put my attention on one of the the the, the, the territory of one of the devas uh -huh. and it amps it way up. Amps it up. Yeah, and amps it way up. So they're kind of like I can live on that. Uh, they're interacting with each other as well. The, uh -huh. the, the awake ones are are creating synthesis, and especially yeah, especially the throat and, and heart ones right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Did they see you as a kind of a project? Like, hey, boys, we got a live one here. Let's let's really kind of work on this guy. And uh, well, probably, but I, 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 I don't I don't I'm not aware of that part. But I'm <laughs> I'm pretty sure. That, I mean, it, I do feel like I'm in some kind of training program or whatever. Uh -huh. you know, it's just kind of because it's sort of like, okay, now we're finished with this lesson. Now it's this one. And, yeah. Know, well, we're all in sort of a training program, yeah, each yeah. in our own ways and exactly, our own yeah, grades. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Um, so what else you got in your notes there? Okay. Let me just. Uh, well, there are points we didn't talk about here. Um, yeah. Um, so the other thing that uh, I want to talk about was the book. Yeah, uh, I think we t touched on it briefly in the first interview. but I don't think uh, you had written it in the first interview. Well, it was written, but uh, not finished. Oh, okay. And it was basically what it needed to wait for was the Parabrahman shift. So and, that, and that tremendous so that introduction, actually... you, had, you had to wait for that. <laughs> a brilliant piece of from, writing. From Rick Archer, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and the, uh, uh, but yeah, basically, it, it, it's a kind of a project that I'm, that's, was driven by the process. Uh, a lot of my life, uh, there isn't a person here managing my life in that kind of sense. It's a, uh, it's managed by nature, uh, and um, there's certainly, you know, I, there's there's opinions and and uh, a taste and stuff like that. But but there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, flow of nature through the life, and so a lot of it's allowing 
life to unfold how it's unfolding, which okay. took a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but and there's still areas of life that could use some work. So uh, writing the book was a good example where you know I, I was trying to get it finished. I actually hoped to have it finished before the first interview, but mm -hmm. certainly didn't. Um, and uh, but it turned out that the the, the parabrahman stage needed to unfold first, so that I could actually, actually talk about it in a semi-intelligent way. And uh, so. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, like, it finally happened. So I got it. I got it finished and, and published. Uh, so this, the book is about the seven stages of enlightenment. Um, it's mainly written for not seven states of consciousness, but seven stages of enlightenment. Yeah. Well, states of consciousness. They're not different. I mean, yeah. not, not like Margie's seven state model. You're talking. Yeah, about. Yeah. Those are concluded in it. Yeah. Um, uh, but it kind of goes a little further from what he brought out uh, back in the day. Um, and, and the main motivator is because I, I because I write about this stuff online, uh, I get a lot of contact from people who are having shifts they don't understand, they don't have the background, uh, or or their the tradition they were in, or the teachings they've heard don't cover the territory, or the teaching said it's supposed to happen this way and it's happening this other way, mm. uh, and, and various kinds of things. So there's a, it's it's written as a kind of a, an overview of the process and some of the primary variations and what mm -hmm. drives that. Um, so that people, you know, to support people on their journey. Um, I mean, it's also, it's, it's kind of like a map. And uh, so definitely reading this can create concepts, but you know, the map is not the road. That's certainly a dynamic, mm -hmm. but you know, the mind has a certain nature and if you don't give it a good map, it'll kind of make up its own, yeah. uh, which may not be helpful. Um, and so, uh, the, the, you know, so for people who say, you know, not to be, they don't. There are teachers I've I've met who uh, don't talk about the stages because it'll create concepts. But the mind's got to create concepts anyways, from my experience. And so it's better to have good concepts and then recognize that it's a map to be dropped because the reality is beyond the mind, beyond concepts. And so it'll never it'll never be what. Um, yeah. You, I mean, if any teacher concepts. is sitting up in front of a room full of people talking, he's using concepts. Yes, yes. You, and, can't, you uh, can't avoid you, it. <laughs> um, Every single word that we speak is, is a concept that represents something. Right, exactly. And you can't communicate without it. Because uh, yeah. even words themselves are uh, essentially idea forms that we have a, a shared idea about. Uh, but there can be variations, you know, like yeah. they use the word awakening. So, uh, the, I mean, yeah. concepts shouldn't have a bad reputation they, as long as they're substantiated by experience. I think that's probably what those teachers were saying. They don't yeah. want you getting all hung up on. But, but getting attached to those concepts. Yeah. Because if you get attached to those concepts, that can actually be a, a barrier to the shift. Well, I see one, one thing I've seen over the years, ever since I stood, started doing BATCAP, was people who mistake the concept of non duality for the actual living experience yeah. of it yeah. and, and assume that they have achieved sort of some non-dual state, whereas really they've just gotten a little bit hypnotized by the concept. Right, and that's actually one of the things I talk about in the book a little bit, because a lot of people talk about self-realization in terms of non-duality, yeah. but in, in the original texts, uh, self-realization is described as dvaita, duality, because so there's the experience of being awake within and a separate, perhaps illusory, but not always, uh, world. And so there's two things there, and you may write that off. Oh, the world's an illusion, but it's still separate. It's not part of the. It's not part of the whole. Part of the oneness. It's not a non-dual stage, mm -hmm. and it's actually not until later in unity, where, where the you know the oneness has progressively expanded, and even more so in Brahman, where it's an actual non-dual yeah. uh, stage. Now, um, you sent me an email the other day, which I thought was fascinating. I think you sent it to both myself and Kristen Kirk, um, which talked about, uh, and if this is too abrupt a segue for you, right. let me know. I don't want to cut you off from something you're going to talk about. But it talked about how awakening or realization could have very different flavors or emphases depending upon which guna was predominant in the nervous system. Right, yeah. And well, right. tighten up your mic again because you keep tugging on it there. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, moving my legs around. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah, thought that was very interesting because you, you hear these people talk about it. You have Bernadette Roberts saying this and so-and-so saying that. And, right. and there seems to be some fundamental disagreement among them. Yeah. But uh, when you uh, yeah. look at it in the way you explained it, there really isn't. It's just that they have different glasses on according to their yeah. neurophysiological makeup. Okay, so first thing is there's, there's 
this concept from, from Vedic uh, philosophy of the gunas. There are essentially three qualities. Fundamental, fundamental qualities of creation, maintenance, and destruction. Uh -huh. and, and that the inter, interplay of those gunas is what leads to the various uh, qualities of, of the world appearance. Now, we tend to have a dominant guna in our, in our functioning, so that we have them, we're of course- Everyone has sure one all, or another dominant guna. Yeah, so we all have all of them, but they'll, they'll tend to be a dominant one. And for most people in the world, Thomas, dom, Thomas guna is, is dominant, yeah. uh, which is essentially inertia. Uh, Dullness. Yeah, uh, and it, uh, so the consciousness is, is not as clear, and so we experience the world as solid and real, mm -hmm. because it's, there's that quality of, of solidity, inertia, that's dominant. When we, we engage in spiritual practices, and, and well, there's various things that can influence it, but that's a big one. We shift into rajas, uh, fire, or transformation, uh, guna becomes more prominent. And uh, that, this, is, this is, comes from Shankara, by the way. Uh, this is something he, he brought out. Um, uh, when when Rajas becomes more dominant, then we come to see the world as illusory. The deeper reality become get, gets a. Didn't you say that sense. with the Thomas? No, no, no. The world is real. Oh, it seems real with Thomas. Thomas. Okay. And with with Rajas, it becomes seen as right. illusory, which is, is is a sign of spiritual progress. But it's interesting. It's quite commonly uh, quite common to have it with self-realization, to, to because of spiritual practice and so on. But the two aren't tied together. Uh, the, the guna uh, evolves distinctly from the stages in consciousness. So people can, can wake up and still experience the world as real, mm -hmm. solid. They can wake up and experience the world as illusory. Mm -hmm. Or the third, the third type, when sattva becomes dominant, uh, with clarity or purity, uh, there isn't really a good English word for it, then the, uh, the person experiences the world as the divine play, lila. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, that can also be dominant when somebody is self-realized. If, if there's a, um, if sattva is dominant, then they're much more likely to have a God consciousness phase. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, if uh, it's not, then uh, some people skip it. They go from self-realization to unity. Mm. Uh, and the God realization or God uh, consciousness stage tends to happen much later. Mm. Uh, so I being in unity is, increases sattva, and then with the increase of sattva, they eventually have that phase. Yeah, a friend of mine in, in Brahman is having their, has had their God consciousness, or has stepped into their God uh -huh. consciousness phase. Does God conscious? Well, I don't want to. This is we should keep focusing on this. But does if you're having a God consciousness phase, as you put it, um, does that? What does that mean exactly? You're, are you are you experiencing celestial perception? Are you experiencing angels and s subtle beings, or, or what? Yeah, that's essentially it, it's a combination. It's it's kind of like uh, Shiva is is kind of like the masculine consciousness mm -hmm. side of the equation. Shakti is the feminine side. And that, so that's the awakening heart mm -hmm. and the refinement of perception. So it's kind of becoming aware of all those layers between the physical the surface, uh, the surface levels and consciousness. There's all that stuff in between the bliss body and the, and the, uh, the field of creation and so on like that, where the, these dynamics are taking place. And once you become aware of those, then it's kind of the dynamics, you're, you're experience of the world is quite different because wh wh how you see it becoming is different. Huh. What you see underlying it is different. So you can be in unity, you can experience the world in terms of the self, and yet not have experienced all of its subtle strata. Exactly. Huh. It's and, funny and because it also, seems like you would have to have experienced But there's also people who, who have that refined perception who aren't awake yet. Who haven't. Who haven't even realized the self. Yeah, they haven't yeah, realized the self and consciousness, but they've recognized the, the flow of divinity and the refined perception. They're seeing subtle beings they've or whatever. they an awakening heart. Yeah. Although, uh, uh, as Maharishi said, you can't really know God per se until, until you're awake. Because you, you don't have know, a foundation. Until you know who you are. Yeah. yeah. Because until there's that stable uh, platform of consciousness, awake consciousness within, then it's hard for the really refined perception to... Yeah to be uh, stable because it's so fine that when, you know, with the mind kicking things around, it's, it's really hard for that to unfold. Yeah, he also said that there would be a certain immensity of the experience of God, which would be overwhelming. He said God couldn't yeah. even telephone from a distance. You'd be crushed. <laughs> well, that's the thing with the, you know, pure divinity. It's like, there's, so there's this embodiment of this stuff, but just, uh, 
putting the attention on pure divinity, and it's like uh, this, the, the, this physiology isn't capable of knowing. Sustaining it. Well, no, I can, it's sustained, but to the degree I can, but it's quite clear that there's a, a lot more potential. And I'm yeah. sure some of that will unfold, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah, you were talking about the Kalas earlier, and um, I interviewed this guy from, who had, had a background with the Theosophical Society, and he was saying that in their worldview, um, you know, once you've reached, reached the pinnacle of human evolution, whatever that might be, uh, and, th and then you drop the body, then you're kind of back in kindergarten at the next sort of whole <laughs> range of, it wouldn't of surprise potential me. progression. Every, every time I've had a stage shift, uh, in like from self-realization or into unity, or whatever, it feels like you're back in kindergarten again. Because yeah. now the, the, the platform you're experiencing reality from has changed, and, uh, and as you go further along, the, the whole environment of your reality has changed as well because yeah. they both go together when you the later change change uh, shifts and some people might find that discouraging or disheartening you know <laughs> they might no. think oh god am i always going to be chasing the dangling carrot oh no no it's not it, it, it's it's like an, an adventure it's it's, yeah. it's really cool <laughs> but yeah i mean that, i find it more inspiring than anything yeah, um, no, it's, because it's, it's like oh boy you know the the wonders never cease <laughs> well yeah and even within in within the unity stages the stage rather there's a series of sub stages within uh -huh. that as you progressively become right or recognize yourself as more and more and more and uh, and so there's kind of like these progressive shifts and they're inclusive of the layers of experience, but also all those subtler layers, and like I say, past and future and memory and all this kind of thing. And so it, it, there's this progressive series of shifts. It makes you very good at, at letting go and stuff, because it's right. because your it keeps reality keeps changing. Yeah. So you're saying a minute ago that um, you know, I guess this was attributed to Shankara that according to the predominance of the guna, yeah. you're gonna your awakening is going to have a different flavor or right, character, right. and you're orientation to the world is going to be different, either, you know, what is it, um, real or illusory or divine. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it's interesting too, because Maya, if you look at the roots of Maya, it means to build. Huh. It doesn't actually mean illusion. Well, it means the creation. I, I remember it being defined as, you know, that which is not, ma, ya, that, not which. Oh, interesting, yeah. Uh, but anyway, maybe yeah, it could yeah. mean both things. A lot yeah, of these yeah, things yeah. have many exactly. yeah. meanings. Clear, clear meanings. Um, yeah. But another thing I'm wondering along these very same lines is, um, you know, some people make a big emphasis on there being no remains of any sense of a personal self anymore. They seem, they seem, they say they've lost the sense of a personal self, although yeah. in interacting with them, they very much seem to have one. Yeah. But they say, well, that's just your perception. You're not seeing it through my eyes. They using the word my. Um, there's, yeah. there's no, there's no one here. And I wonder if that's a guna thing too, where that would. Yeah, you know, that actually, that's actually a good point. Um, I hadn't thought of that that way. Uh, yeah, that might relate to that. Uh, Sorry. That's just your glasses. You haven't yeah. pulled the mic off yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that could be. I, I, I haven't thought about think that. about that one, huh? Yeah. Um, what, what's but, your but orientation there are, but there are, cause, Well, Lauren talks about that sometimes, uh -huh. too. Um, but the orientation I have is that I, that I experience there being a person. Uh -huh. It's not the center so of I stick you with a pin? Yeah. And I'll, I'm not I'll sticking go. the couch, I'm sticking you. Yeah, I'll go, ouch. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and there are certainly opinions here and, and tastes. I like this, I don't like that. And is it a person and, who has those? Or there's some well, yeah, flavor of yeah. it? But it's like it's not a, it's not, it's like before it was what I was. Yeah. And now it's kind of like this, uh, well, it's like the idea of, of the Laisha Vidya. There's like the, the, you handle some butter and then there's the, grease there's on the a palm. little bit of grease on the palm. It's kind of like that. There's this, this, there's this sheen on the surface that has, there's the laws of nature that are, that are functioning a certain way here that have, you know, the ability to write, but, but uh, not so much to Play back. pole vault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pole vault. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, there's skill areas and, and you know, and, and so on. But, yeah, and all those uh, make up a personality. Yeah, and there's certain ways. But there is this quality of, of Leisha Vidya that's there that, that because you can't really function in the world unless you 
you're, you know that there's a because you, you know you know you don't just walk out into traffic and you can drive your car down the road. There has to be some quality that's looking out through this person and functioning that way. Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems that way to me. I, I can't argue too far with people who say that there's no sense of a person because uh, you, you know you can't really deny anyone's experience. But well, I've never I, understood it. Yeah, no. I, well, an example for me when I first uh, woke up, had the self-realization shift. There was a sense of ego death. Yeah, utterly. And, yeah, it felt like it. But what I realized so after someone said, "Hey, David," you turned your head. I don't oh. remember. But but <laughs> uh, but but what I realized after a short while was what it, what it had actually ended was the attachment to the ego. Mm -hmm. But the ego as a function to recognize this per, this person versus that person, like you said, not it's not the couch, it's my arm, whatever. Uh, that that function, the hamkara mm -hmm. uh, function, is still there. Yeah. And, and but it's like my little finger; it's not central. It's just mm -hmm. there. A uh, similar thing actually happened with the unity shift. There was a collapse of uh, what I call the core identity. Uh, various teachers talk about it in different ways, but there's kind of like the identity has kind of a three-level structure. Mm -hmm. The concepts of, of a me, which falls away with self-realization. Um, the energetic drivers of that, uh, and that that falls away in the in the kind of the GC phase, assuming people are cleaning, God cleaning up and stuff. Phase, yeah, yeah. Um, in, assuming people are cleaning things up, and then um, in the gut, it's kind of like a core grip, a core identity um, that's not usually conscious until um, prior to unity. Although uh, Suzanne Marie, for example, had it with her Brahman shift. Mm -hmm. So it kind of varies. And, I, and I've since met people who haven't had it yet in Brahman. Mm -hmm. So it, it varies. It's, a, it's a somewhat different process. It's a, quite like an embodiment thing. Um, but anyways, with the loss of that core identity, there was a loss of any sense of personal me. Yeah. And so the, any you know, personal pronouns, uh, David, it was meaningless. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, that lasted about two weeks, huh. and then it kind of integrated. So if I had bought into that, I may have, you know, taken on a spiritual name or something, and <laughs> and, uh, and and you know, uh, stopped using personal pronouns. Uh, you know, friends kind of joked about my my um, the person formerly known as David. But, but it's uh, almost like the, the da David was still there. He was just, one, one analogy I thought of is like, was you know. was no longer part of the awareness, though. Yeah, but like if you're in a dark room, a candle can be really bright. But if you take it out in the sunshine, you can barely see the flame because there's so yeah. much sunlight. Yeah. So there could have been this infusion of light, metaphorically speaking, which made yeah. it really hard to locate the individual. But it was, yeah, but it was also like when I woke up, there was a, there was a, um, uh, and with the ego death thing, there was, when I next sat down to meditate, mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out how to meditate because huh. the person that meditated was no longer there. Right. <laughs> but then after a couple of days, it, sort of, it integrated. But you could figure out how to go to the bathroom and how to brush yeah. your teeth. Well, and... well, the automatic functions still yeah. work. Um, but um, maybe but the was thing really was odd. you're sort of already in the transcendence. So how could you? Why or how would you meditate? Well, there was that too. You get it, someplace it where you already were. Yeah, it, it, that, 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 it, it did definitely change. It was sort of like dropping the relative instead of going somewhere. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was really curious experiences. Huh. There was some sense of a person way, way off in space somewhere, but it was, you know, how did I meditate with that? But you know, like I say, it, it integrated after a few days, and yeah. then, I was, then I was able to re resume practice. Okay. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was an interesting uh, process. So I can see why people talk about that, and because uh, I can see the experience. But for me, in every case, um, the, it, the the distinctions integrated, and then um, then there was it's like it, the priority shifted, but the, um, what was it? The center shifted, but the uh, basics were were. Um, were reintegrated. Have you seen cases where people um, get to a certain stage and then they kind of fixate on it and assume that they're done and don't move on? Yeah, yeah. It's actually I was writing, uh, corresponding with somebody just uh, last week, and and they were uh, they had reached the, the third time where they felt done. Yeah. And and so yeah, the very much people can feel quite done after they wake up, and they even start to teach. I mean, I, I had this sense of wanting to go out and tell the world. I've had people tell me they've woke, done. People I've interviewed, you know. But I, I knew better than to do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah. But I've I've reached 
uh, I don't know how many times, but there's, there can be this sense of, of being complete and done at certain points. But then after a little bit of time, then some new vistas open up. It's kind of like, you know, when you first wake up, there's a sense of, you know, it, liberation, I'm free, it, it's, uh, that process is done, there's no more to do, I'm not the doer. But then maybe you start to think, okay, what is doing? Yeah. It's still happening. How do I tune myself to this doing so yeah. that so that I'm I don't have you know events that show up in my life that are uh, caused by friction and, yeah. and uh, discord? Uh, how do I clear that that up? And when you get to know the process better, then you can move more into the flow of it. Mm. Yeah, maybe it's natural that there be resting places after significant shifts where you could just sort of enjoy that for a bit without worrying about whatever. Yeah. What more there might be, but then the yeah. force of evolution naturally, yeah. you know, gives you a prod. Yeah. Well, one of the big things that tends to happen is you create this big open space with yeah. a shift, and then anything that's unresolved starts uh, to bubble starts up. to bubble up into that space to be resolved. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've had I know a couple of people who had a really rough time actually after they woke up because there was stuff that. I didn't think it would be possible to wake up with still carrying that stuff, but and then it they really did, started to and, then the fan. and then it's right in their face because yeah. you can't sort of push it aside. It's conscious right. now. You're conscious now. It's right yeah. there, you know? yeah. and so then they really had to face it. Hmm. So uh, yeah, so preparing the ground is a really good idea. So in a way, you, you're kind of a map maker uh, in terms of uh, delineating all these stages and fine gradations yeah. of stages and so on. It seems to be something you're. You know, you tend to do, and are well, and are equipped to do. You want to comment on that before I continue, because there's a question yeah. here. Well, I just want to a point I didn't make earlier. Yeah. The, the, the third kind of audience for the book is people doing research, mm -hmm. because I've, I, I've seen people are, that are doing research on on this stuff, and they don't have the the complete picture. Yeah, they don't have the the fundamentals, and so they're kind of creating models based on people's experiences or or uh, uh, something else that's, that's not fundamental to the underlying process. Right. For example, in the book I outline the five different ways people will experience awakening subjectively. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because of how they're coming to it, it changes how they experience. Is it, an, is it an awakening from an ego into a no self? Or is it an awakening from an ego into a cosmic self? Or does the ego seem to expand and become a cosmic self? Mm -hmm. And so on. And each of those variations they can sound like they're quite different, but it's actually the same process being experienced somewhat differently subjectively. Whereas there's other things, like I mentioned about the difference between emptiness and nothing, um, and of Brahman, uh, they're actually quite different, mm. but are sometimes confused to be the same thing. Yeah. You know, William James wrote that book, The Varieties of Lig Religious Experience, which I never read, but the, the title kind of is interesting in this light, and I'm wondering if um... the challenge with that kind of thing, though, is is the person doesn't know how to differentiate between someone who's had a shift change and mm -hmm. is is experiencing from a new reality, or has had a passing experience. Yeah, I think you're parsing it much more subtly and comprehensively than he was able to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the the interesting thing here, the one question I want to ask is, um, do you feel that? Uh, we, as a species, will ever reach a point at which we really under we have a very well defined map of of the territory of human experience, kind of like we have the periodic table of elements, or yeah. or uh, you know detailed map of North America now, which through you know satellite imagery and everything is so precise as compared to what Lewis and Clark had. Um, yeah, but the the challenge also though is the platform is evolving. Um, to give you an example, uh, the Yoga Sutra we mentioned earlier, in there, uh, potentially describes waking up, mm -hmm. but he doesn't call it self-realization, or, or he defines it very differently. Mm -hmm. He talks about kaivalya, singularity, and uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense and, until you roll back to that thing I talked about in further along in Unity, where you can recognize that consciousness is aware of itself globally and at every point. So in a higher age, there's that potentiality to know you're a point, and for that point to wake up to its wholeness. Mm -hmm. So it's the singularity. Whereas uh, in the current time, that's not how people experience waking up. Mm 
hmm. so we can create these maps. But you know, the book, for example, isn't is taking these some of this ancient Vedic knowledge, but putting it up in modern language and in the modern context, how people are experiencing it now. Yeah, uh, as opposed to what what uh, potentially described. But I guess the point I was getting at is, um, you know, what science wants to do is it wants to understand how the universe works, right. what's really going on. Right. And, and it's obviously a work in progress. There's every single field of science has plenty of ways to go, plenty of ways to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so with spirituality, um, you know, did anybody ever have it all figured out? <laughs> <laughs> and if not, will anybody? Uh, well, but the thing is, it's not about a person figuring it all out. Yeah. Like the Vedas aren't all known by one person. Right. They're, they're, it's like a library. Well, nor is and, any and scientific thing known by one person. Right. It's a collaborative right. it, effort. It, yeah, it's a collaborative effort. It's known by the group. Yeah. So, uh, so do you think this... Things, okay, one of the experiences okay. I, I have that, that might fill in this a little bit, the Vedas themselves are encoded with, they're essentially encoded experiences yeah. in, in the fundamentals of consciousness, but they're encoded with the person that's going to experience it. Mm -hmm. Cognize it. So uh, there, there, essentially, there's a specific person that is born and has the experience, and what that does is it it awakens those laws of nature that are associated with that, and and again that they're mentioned in the you know if you look at the 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 um, the Vedas it talks about the the Rishi the Devata the Chandas Valley it's the, the the meter, and um, and it's. So it's, it's kind of like there's this blueprint, and at a certain point in time, somebody comes forward, they have this experience, they awaken those principles in life, and the universe can evolve. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like the, the, the Vedas is a description of those uh, key uh, signposts is the wrong word, but the key points in the process where the next stage can, can uh, it's time for the next stage to uh, come along. So are you saying that, I think you're sort of saying that the Vedas are, you know, they, they're more fundamental than the universe itself, they're this sort of ultimate template of creation, mm -hmm. and that uh, no one person can, un can know the whole template, people can yeah. um, know the field from which, in which the template resides, but, but but it's but by by them having that experience, it's kind of handed into group consciousness. In the book, I talk about uh, three stages of cognition or three mm -hmm. types of cognitions, and there's those kind of original ones that I'm talking about there. But there's also other ones where where they're revived, work where, where they've gone dormant and then they're revived again in a rising age, mm -hmm. and then uh, where the uh, someone more. Uh, Earlier on, they have a basic cognition where they're, they're, more people are having that experience. Mm. More people are having that cognition, which enlivens it in consciousness. So it's it's like a, a group effort. Yeah. So this person wakes up this deva, this person cognizes this thing, this person brings forward this knowledge in this way, uh, this person uh, publishes you know Eckhart's book, and mm -hmm. and this person. Uh, so the result is this group collaborative effort that together raises the whole yeah. and makes it kind of part of the group. And so then, you know, I don't, I don't have the, the time in my entire life to even to have the experience of what it's like to be every kind of creature yeah. and being. And would it so, really be useful or necessary to know exactly, that? Exactly. You know? And uh, whereas it might be someone else's dharma to bring that right. out more. And, and, uh, yeah, and in a scientific sense, no one has the time in life to study all the disciplines and get to the, yeah. the cutting edge of every field of human knowledge. Yeah, well, or, or another example would be we, we live in a, in a there, there's the divine, there's kind of like these thoughts of the divine and which, which express as creations and we happen to be in a creation that's quite a bit more complex and within that creation are multiple universes and in each universe is the laws of nature are a little bit different, so different kinds of beings are being expressed and so on. And, you know, just to, just to take a scan of the, the different universes would, would take more than a lifetime. So it, it's there, there's there's so much vastness. That well, this possible. universe alone has ten trillion galaxies. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so there's you know there's only so much an individual attention can can yeah. can process. So there's just this vastness, and it takes it takes all of us to do this together. And, and like I meant, we talked about earlier, the. Um, with the devas waking up, they play an also another role. So it's not just humans doing this, but other 
uh, other uh, kinds of beings. And I suspect at a certain point, even uh, more, uh, what's the more, less evolved beings, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, some of the animals and this kind of thing, uh, will probably be part of that too, I would, mm -hmm. I would expect. Yeah. Well, they say in Sat Yuga, you know, the animals are kind of much more conscious and awake and, and everything yeah. than they are. Well, because we're all in the same consciousness, yeah. so it's, you know, if you raise that up to that level, then I mean, everything is raised. Rama up. had monkeys and bears helping him fight Ravana. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Rama had the snake. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like in the, uh, since I asked you that question 10 minutes ago, uh, our discussion of it has given me a better feeling for the answer to it. Uh, which is that, you know, the universe itself is sort of God involved in a, a hide-and-seek operation, you know, self-exploration thing, which, um, and it, it's almost presumptuous of, of a human being to, to suggest that in, in either science or spirituality we'll ever get a complete, detailed, nail-it-down, yeah. understanding of every last little mystery of creation. It's all, there's always going to be room for exploration yeah. and, and discovery. And, and for me, it's, it's, for, it's an evolution. And, and uh, these days, I can shift to a different reality depending on how I want to explore. I'll explore. Yeah, so there's the reality that nothing has ever been created in the first place and never will be. Mm -hmm. There's the reality that, that the divinity is profoundly self-networked and there's no reason for it to ever express because it already knows. And, and then there's the reality where the the universe, you know, like the Vedas and the Devas waking up and that kind of thing we were talking about earlier, uh, the universe is going through a process of waking up and, and it goes through these vast cycles and, and uh, you know, there's an article where I talk about why, why would creation repeat itself hmm. if, it's, if the purpose of creation is to come to, to know itself. Why would it do it again? <laughs> and, and, but, well, it, but it doesn't. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's why do you of, wake up the next day after having already been awake the previous day? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get to experience it again. A little bit of difference. Yeah. And so there's a, there, they're, all, they're all essentially perspectives, and each perspective has uh, knowledge that comes with it. Yeah. Ways of knowing and stuff like that. And it's, it's profound to, to experience uh, pure divinity, this profound self-knowing. But... But there's no learning to happen in that. It's already known. So whereas going down in, and coming into a human experience, there's all kinds of learning that can take place and there's all kinds of nuances that can be fleshed out. And all these different uh, variations, all these different uh, beings experiencing in different ways brings out different aspects and, mm -hmm. and moves things along. We all have a part to play in this, uh, mm. in this Leela. I was just going to say, and you, you can see why they use that word. Yeah. Play. The yeah. whole thing is like, whoa, what a game, you know? Yeah. On the you stage know, of be, life, yeah. It's so much more entertaining than just yeah. sort of... Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was certainly a relief, though, when you, when you can sit back and watch the stage as opposed to being on the stage and, and seeing it as real. Because then it's like, you, oh, you can get into the suffering and yeah, the, all the drama. Yeah, it can be stuff. very, it can seem, and you know, and there can be circumstances. We live fairly blessed lives in terms of our oh, health and yes. our food and our economics and our comfort and all that stuff, but you know, some people are really going through it in this world yeah. and you can't blame them for seeing it as real. Right. You know, if you're well, if that's in, their in experience. the Congo going through what women are going through there, or in Aleppo yeah. going through yeah. bombings. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's their experience, that's yeah. their experience. But yeah. it's beautiful that, that there is this awakening happening on a yeah. larger and larger scale in the world. Thank because God. it's going to rise people out of that over time. Lift all boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's, that's really beautiful. Yeah. I have no idea who... How much time has passed? I don't know. How much time has passed? One and a half hours. One and a half hours. Okay. Um, see anything else there? Oh, uh, one thing. Uh, one thing that would be, be interesting to touch on, that I became aware of more recently. There's a, uh, Aja Shanti talks about head, heart, gut. Right. Um, Essentially, when you when you there, there's the process of kundalini rising to the crown, 
an awakening, and then there's a, a descent of, you can say a descent of embodiment. Uh, Shakti rises to join Shiva, and then they descend together. And uh, there's this prominent predominance of head, heart, gut. I mentioned earlier about those three values of ego, the mm -hmm. concepts, the emotional drivers, and the core grip. Um, but why just those three chakras? Well, there's also the gut, the, the rather the root that's, um, uh, that, from my experience, was related to Brahman. But uh, but why why those why why didn't the throat wasn't the throat yeah. one of the stages? And the um, but solar it, plexus or but whatever. It, but it turns out because it's kind of um, well, from, from my experience, it's the the descent is happening on a subtler level than the rise. It's like the uh, Kundalini uh, in those uh, koshas, we were the, the layers we were talking about earlier. Uh, the chakras are introduced on the bliss in the bliss body level, uh, bliss body kosha, and then they express forward through the layers into the energy body, and so um, there's kind of and they become more and more specific. They, they're they're universal at first, and then and so they have universal devas associated with them, but as they move forward into uh, ex expression into your individual body, then you can get them different spaces and misaligned and you know various kinds of, uh, and, and then we have the individual expression of them in the energy body. Um, but it's also why the chakras are experienced um, differently. You know, some people will describe chakras with a geometry, some people and or, or mantra. Some people will talk about. Um, the flowers as flowers, and some people talk about vortexes. Mm -hmm. Those experiencing them on different levels, mm. on those different levels. Um, the uh, but it, it turns out that there, there's, on the southern levels uh, are the what's called the mahamarmas, mm -hmm. and so they're kind of like a higher octave of certain chakras. And, and there's the I can't remember the names of them, uh, but there's these three. Hridaya is the is the heart one. So the Anahata chakra and Hridaya, Hridaya Mahamarma, and uh, Basti is the gut or something. Anyways, but but, <laughs> but, like but they mark the they mark <laughs> if a person ha, has a has a practice and and, and so on. If their process is to have the full range of you know. Uh, Self-realization, God consciousness, unity. Now, then it's the, the the awakening of the 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 head, the concepts of self, the concept, of the ego dynamics, um, is the head mahamarma, and then the the heart mahamarma with God consciousness and the gut with unity. Uh, so that's, I, the book didn't have that in that's a more recent discovery because hmm. I'd heard of Hridaya chakra, but um, the higher octave version, but I hadn't realized it was a mahamarma. Hmm. Detail it ties several traditions together. Yeah, so there's there's room for exploration here. I don't know if we want to go into it anymore, but um, I mean this whole thing of the the chakras awakening. I guess most people conceive of it as happening sequentially and in an ascending order. Right. And um, you're saying that well maybe. But that but it's an energy. But it's uh, one thing that's important to understand is is that. That process is not causal of the awakening. It's it's a embody. It's the way correlation. We, it's not causal. No, but is it correlated? Yes, it's correlated. So there's a process. For example, someone can have the the you know uh, self realization and then unity, mm -hmm. and and skip that process and not have God consciousness until later. And uh, similarly with the with the chakra rising is a way of embodying the energetic embodying and clearing the channels so that we can. Uh, uh, hold the, the awakening when it, when it happens, but the rising kundalini itself doesn't cause it. The, the awakening is driven by divinity itself. People say it's, it happens by grace. Grace. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it's, it's divinity. It's like this um, kind of like this little little drop of yeah of pure divinity. But is it preparatory? I mean, could you say that it's well, it's a good preparation. Yeah. But but uh, but there there are some people who have the approach that that if I can get my my kundalini up to the crown, I'll, I'll have done. my awakening. I'll have my awakening. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know. Which has a very sort of individual effort kind of connotation. To yeah. It, if whereas, I can do this, and I'm exactly. Gonna... Whereas awakening is a is a letting go. It's an allowing or a surrender. It's yeah. Because it's the divine that's doing it. It's not you. It's not the person. Right. And that's actually a good point too. I mentioned in my last interview also that that. Um, it's not the person that wakes up. 
we wake up from the person. Right. So yeah, a lot of people there's, say there's, that. Yeah. yeah. So there's nothing. There's not nothing a person can do to awaken. They they can prepare the ground mm -hmm. so that so that when the uh, an opportunity arises, when when that opening can happens, that they're able to stabilize it and, and keep it, and it's they're able to have a smoother process. So it's very valuable to have those the spiritual techniques, but the techniques themselves will never cause the awakening because it's it's. It's divine that's doing it. Yeah. So is it sort of like the divine, if we want to, mm, what's the word? Not that anthropomorphize, but maybe, but personalize it. Uh, personalize. Does the divine sort of keep an eye on humanity and say, well, this guy's ready. Bless him with awakening. Uh, you know, metaphorically speaking. I mean, it's yeah, not I literally don't, I don't, like that, but it's yeah. more like when you're ready to pop, you don't pop through your own. Well, you're, when you're ready to pop, you're. It's because it's time. It's kind of. But a whole lot of because it's a transformation has taken yeah. place to get you to that point. Yeah, and when we're when we're going through the process, we don't experience. We don't recognize necessarily that there's a process taking place and and that's going to lead to here. It's only when we look back in retrospect mm -hmm. that we see, oh, that actually contributed and that contributed too. I didn't think that was, you know, even something, you know, a disaster or something really nasty happening yeah. can be a profound. Uh, healing, which leads to the awakening, sure. and it's like that. Um, so we can't see while we're in the middle of it what what how it's contributing, but later on we can look back and and mm -hmm. and see. But there is definitely this kind of process where we're being uh, I don't know guided. But again, it's not us doing it; it's, yeah. it's doing through. Well, us. there's that saying, you know, God helps those who help themselves, and yeah, yeah. there's also the saying of. Uh, you know, you're more, you're more, uh, in, you're more inclined to wake up. Or was, was well, enlightenment more? may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there of. are, I think, various points where somebody might make the shift, but if they don't, you know, if they get a, a, a call, a movement, a sense of that they should go and see a teacher, and they resist and and don't do it, uh, or whatever, there's some circumstance that they're they're presented in, and they're not they're not ready, or they don't, then it. Uh, um, you know, the opportunity is, it goes by. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not like we, we should be trying to double or second guess our life or anything like that. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. But, but I, you know, I, I think that it's, if it's meant to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. In spite just, of anything uh, we do. You just have to be cautious not to give people the impression that they can just do whatever the hell they please and, and enlightenment's going enlightenment's to happen if it's supposed to happen. It just sounds too defeatist or something. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, Patanjali, back to Patanjali, he, he talks about yogis being mild, medium, or intense in terms of their determination mm. and, you know, degrees of intensity up to vehement. And the, okay. those with the vehement intensity are more likely to uh, yeah. and awaken. Yeah, and there's a lot of little things in there too. Um, like in the seventh model of the Rig Veda, Vasishta, the sage Vasishta, he, he mentions that it, the importance of desiring unity. Yeah. So there has to be some forward movement there mm -hmm. to, for, uh, it seems, some intention to move forward. And, uh, you know, as I've observed, if you don't know it's there, uh -huh. you're not going to desire it. If you think you're, if you feel done, right. then, then, you know, and so I think that's the concept of being done or the concept that there's only self-realization can actually turn into a barrier in itself. Mm -hmm. um, because then, because then you think there's nothing more, then there's not, there's not going to be any attention, not going to be attention. Which um, highlights the value of what you're doing, uh, and what I'm trying to do with this show, yeah. is to, to have greater knowledge out there in terms of the possibilities. Because otherwise people can shortchange themselves thinking that you yeah. know, some relatively minor attainment is, is yeah. the end. And I wasn't even really aware of some of this stuff. And yeah, it was that was possible and huh. until quite recently. Yeah. yeah, but the whole thing about grace—I guess we've covered it. But just um, what's this? You talked about the. Okay, here's a question. A question from a listener. <laughs> Anu asks. You talked about the Kundalini rising um, and how that is not indicative of self-realization or awakening. How about the reverse in an awakened person? Has the kundalini risen? You understand the question? Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'm no expert in, in kundalini, but uh, from what I've seen, usually. But um, like one of the one of the dynamics that I, I experienced, which I had no explanation for for a mm -hmm. long time, was when I started witnessing in the 70s. Uh, according to the the information I had, that indicated 
self-realization. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wasn't self-realized because there was still an identified ego there. There was that duality we talked about earlier. Um, much later, uh, a friend of mine uh, had a book then, and I was, I was looking at it, and it talked about this process. Was, there's a, in the Kundalini rise, where um, just above the third eye, there's a point called Makara. And if the Kundalini reaches that point, it becomes stable, it doesn't go back down anymore. Up until that point, it tends to go up and down. Um, if it reaches that point, there tends to be this certain kind of experience. In my case, there was a brilliant white flash, and, and everything disappeared for a short time. And, um, and then, uh, and basically, I witnessed thereafter. Mm -hmm. And um, and because it, and it, there's kind of like a witness point just below that. In the and witnessing itself. thereafter included during sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So so the um, so the witnessing, you know, if the Kundalini is rising up and, and going down again, the witnessing can come in and then go and come in and go. Mm -hmm. But once it reaches Makara, it remains stable. And there's only a short distance between between. Um, that an awakening, right. uh, but for me it was about 31 years. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and but what the, the Kundalini Vidya tradition that talked about this mm -hmm. um, mentioned was that uh, sometimes it can stop there to allow the uh, body to, to clear out because the the crown chakra kind of manages the process and uh, to help clear out the physiology and make it more ready, mm -hmm. so that when I did wake up, it was very clear and solid right away. And there was a couple of the stages came quite quickly afterwards mm. because there had been that preparation. Whereas some people will, will awaken earlier and they'll have more processing to do after the after the first shift. Mm. Uh, it's just, you know, it, I like to say everybody's process is a bit different. Okay. So, um, so it was, the point I was making though what was uh, Kundalini coming to the crown is not the cause of the awakening; it's the embodiment. So it's it's so there's a process of preparation where the kundalini comes up. So by the time someone is awake, the kundalini is up, um, but it may come pretty well up beforehand, or it may come up at the same time, or it may come up when they're stabilizing the the shift. They have the opening, and then the shift stabilizes. It's uh, they're they're tied. They're, there's a correlation. It's just uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make. It's just it's not causal. And so trying to force the kundalini, right. um, you know, from what I've seen is not is not productive. Can and the dangerous. people that I know that have done that, it can be dangerous. And the people I know that have done that have, have a much rougher process. Mm, yeah, I know some people who've gone through very rough kundalini processes. Yeah, you know. And they, they even consider themselves to have had some circuits fried permanently as a result. You know. Um, yeah, it's a it's a powerful energy, yeah. and if you uh, practice appropriate practices, uh, it arises naturally on its own accord. You don't yeah. need to push it. So just to rehash that just a little, um, is it possible that Kundalini can fully rise and yet you're not awakened, or you can be awakened and it's not fully risen, or do the two correlate closely enough that if it has fully risen, you are awakened? I can see, from what I said earlier, I can see some variation in that, that it could come up and, and yet the, the awakening, because I've, I've seen people, for example, who wake up and because it's so ordinary and normal and simple, and they have all these concepts of what it's supposed to look like, they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it takes a while for them to accept it and where they start to see that things have changed and, and how they're responding to life and so on like that. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of variations in how it, it shows up. Uh, for me, uh, as I mentioned, it was really clear and distinct, and so there was no, you know, there was an ego death. Uh, it was very distinct, and so there was no mistaking it for me. But other people, it's it's much softer, and and there's uh, and we joked about oozing on the uh, last interview. Oozing, yeah. Yeah, there's kind of like this gra very slow, gradual process. It's very Some gentle, are and, and they're just kind of, you know, I've I've met a couple of people who didn't know they're awake and have been awake for for a decade. Huh. Because they were just, expecting something else. Yeah, they're expecting some flashiness and and some some you know skills or whatever. What which event, which again points to the value of knowledge. Yeah, exactly. You know? and and once they knew they were awake, their progress kicked up because yeah. then they were engaging it and and paying attention to it. It wasn't just kind of this background thing that was there in their lives. It's almost like I mean, what I sense or have, in my opinion, um, the knowledge component is you could almost say as important as the experience component in the whole evolutionary process. Right. Um, you know, you really can't 
take that far, uh, that big a step with one leg without bringing the other leg along. Yeah. <laughs> and well, it's, it's you, like you got to just keep the two apace. Yeah, it's like the map uh, analogy. You can, you can uh, you know, experience going down the road and you go in and, and stop at the tourist attraction and you stop at a gas station and restaurant and you have these experiences and you can kind of just go driving down the road and see where you're, you know, see where it takes you. But if you actually want to get somewhere, it's useful to know which road to take and and so you have a map and you're experiencing as you go towards that, that destination. Yeah. And um, it's also, again, my observation, um, subject to f flaws uh, and limitations, that a person can be really quite advanced in their evolution and yet due to some, uh, some misunderstanding or lack of understanding or, or something which is not fully developed in that area um, doesn't they, they get stuck in some way they don't realize that there could be more um, and well there, yeah because there's the the kind of thing about wake up grow up uh, clean, clean up, up. yeah because yeah. it's waking up is great but if you don't <laughs> take care of your baggage your your jar garbage and stuff it, it uh, you give more power to it um, so there's a there's a it's a, a holistic kind of process really if you yeah. want, to, want to have the whole person and and uh, you know I'm not sure I haven't I haven't established this yet but it because I've seen people that have made the Brahman shift without letting go of the, the that core grip so mm -hmm. there's still that core unconscious identity that can drive the bus uh, to some degree. Uh, even though the awakeness would be driving the bus most of the time, they can still get caught a little bit by that. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are some people out there that are that have some of that, uh, or that there's there's some subconscious because there's all those layers again. When you've got some junk in the uh, that's unconscious in those subtle layers, you haven't brought light to, and there's resistance to going into whatever charge that there has. It's still going to be having influence on on your expression and how you respond to, to stuff in your life. So what would you prescribe, if you would, uh, and obviously there would be individual prescriptions, um, yeah. but if you could make any sort of general blanket prescription, what would you prescribe as the best means of kind of safeguarding and facilitating the path? Uh, such that one doesn't get stuck, such, such that one continues to um, foster both one's experience and one's understanding. Well, I mean, I found myself being part of a, a, a teaching was useful for a while. Um, it gave me the the well, it gave me the the, the techniques that were were quite effective mm -hmm. to uh, clear the clear the ground and and uh, experience. Uh, samadhi and, and culture the, that source within. Um, it gave me the understanding that I needed to to put it all in some kind of context and understand how to deal with certain kinds of things in life. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, uh, finding a teaching that you resonate with uh, is really valuable. Um, Yeah, to support your support your process, and at a certain point, you well, it's kind of like stages of it. But there's, at a certain point, you gain the the uh, you, you kind of step into the flow of it, and and so that uh, your your life is guided mm. by the process itself, and so you're you're able to work with it. Um, uh, having spiritual community is still valuable, though. Uh, so you, because you can still get caught in your stuff here and there, and, and have it's useful to have people call you on your stuff. <laughs> well, actually, on that note, how how important is it to have a teacher in addition to a teaching? Um, well, it, it, it's it's good for getting the right start, uh, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, there's also around right around unity in there. Um, there's the idea of the resolute intellect. Mm -hmm. And essentially, that intellect level above the bliss body, um, in most people, it's associated with the mental body. So the intellect and the mind are, are tied together. And so the mind is kind of being drifted, you know, moved around by our emotions and our experiences and the, our resistances and that kind of stuff. So the intellect doesn't have a, a really solid platform. But after we, we are clearly awake, 
the intellect comes to associate itself with, with being, with, with that silence within. And so it has a more stable platform. And as per perception refines, the, uh, our ability to discriminate clearly uh, is, gets better, better and better. Mm -hmm. And so there is this idea of the inner guru that comes online mm. in that period where, where you put your attention on something and you experience it, but the intelligence in that also uh, is is known, and so it comes with your experiences come with understanding. Uh, I mean, cause sometimes it's still useful to have perspectives. I mean, I have a few friends. I, I read their their content because they they uh, their perspective is different, and they they bring a you know it's like oh I hadn't noticed that before kind mm -hmm. of a, a thing like the Mahamarmas. Mm -hmm. You know, I was aware of that process, and you know, Adyashanti and some others speak of it but um, I wasn't aware of that connection to the, to the Mahamaras. So are you saying that um, as one progresses, the um, necessity of, of, of a teacher diminishes? I mean, as a general rule that, to which there are probably exceptions, but it's more critical in the beginning than in the final stages or la latter stages? Yeah, getting a good start is, is, is good, because uh, there's a lot of people uh, out there who are just kind of, you know, window shopping a bit you yeah. know, and trying out this and trying out that and, and uh, what, we t what we tend to do is uh, we're driven by the mind often looking for the concepts we like that suit our philosophy or mm -hmm. our approach to life, to life and, and then we kind of, but what that does is kind of uh, enables our concepts um, and we can get even more identified with it. We can look for a philosophy that that um, yeah, Just I mean, there's forces are by our prejudices. Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, the confirmation bias and that kind of thing. Yeah. No, I mean, some of that is fine uh, if we have a, a, a basic platform that's reasonable. But um, uh, but when we when we're, we're basically going out there collecting concepts, and we're we're you know going to be at the San Conference this weekend, science and non-duality concepts. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, and it's full of concepts and. Right. And you see a lot of people there that are basically looking for better concepts and mm -hmm. collecting. And of course, they a lot of them conflict with each other. And and uh, you know, people have these big charts and tables of all these correlations and all this kind of stuff. But oftentimes, it's it's just concepts. Mm. And by itself, without experience, without a means of experience, uh, it can become quite uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, like some people say, for instance, and I think Margie used to say actually that you know the shift to unity kind of necessitates a teacher to dispel some basic doubt that, that kind of grips you at that, at that transition point. The teacher kind of reassures you and dispels a doubt and says this is it, you know, and, and it, it kind of uh, resolves yeah, a fear or a, 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 a yeah. discomfort. That yeah, it's interesting because I, I, um, I had my unity shift on a Lauren Lucia retreat. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so Lauren talked to me about it afterwards, but I didn't have the experience that there was doubt that way. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, Brahman, but it depends. I guess everybody's process is different. Yeah, all right. In some ways, Brahman might require more. So maybe it's uh, too simplistic to try to pin it down in terms of when and how you, you might need a teacher. Maybe. Maybe it's more appropriate to say, you know, it yeah. depends on the person. But you know, also, uh, the stage they're at, what yeah, they're going through. Yeah, getting started, but also verifying an awake, an initial awakening, because often, as I mentioned earlier, uh, often people can have the shift and it's... Not know it. Not know it or right. not be sure because it's because they have these concepts about it. And, and you know, one of the... Th I, I've seen a lot of people wake up, and, and one of the things that, that is almost universal is surprise at how simple it was. Mm -hmm. How could I not have gotten this before yeah. <laughs> after years of practice? And also how normal and ordinary it is. Yeah, and uh, in another vein, it can be terrifying if you had no idea what's happening to you, like Suzanne Siegel, you know, with her Collision with the Infinite <laughs> book. Well, that's interesting, though, actually, because she had, did have background. Well, she had a background, but... But, but she, she fought it. Because she knew, but she couldn't. She didn't believe that that was it. Yeah, I think it, her it, concept that she had formed pre years previously yeah. would just was so different than the actual experience when it dawned yeah, that she exactly. didn't put two and two together. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but there was definitely reason because she had people tell her she was awake, yeah. and she refused to believe it, huh. and she went, went looking for Myself. people to pathologize it, <laughs> right. and yeah, that was, and, and went through this whole struggle, and finally she accepted it, yeah. and then she had and a she unity. relaxed into it. Yeah, and then she had right. a unity switch fairly soon afterwards. That's kind of an extreme extreme example. Though. Yeah, people don't usually fight it that way. But. We probably should have done this in the beginning because uh, we've been and we sort of did do it, but we we've been throwing these terms around and perhaps as a recap. Um, I could answer. I could have you ask answer this question that someone just handed me. How do you define and what are the difference different ex, differences in experience between uh, for unity consciousness, God consciousness, cosmic consciousness? Okay. Um, okay. Co co cosmic consciousness is essentially equivalent to self-realization. The self realizing itself. So there's a shift from, if, if there isn't witnessing in, in uh, prior, uh, which there, there isn't usually, but it's, I, I do know a half dozen people that have that. Um, but there's a shift from being a me experiencing the world, and there might be some sense of presence or consciousness sort of in behind, whatever. Silence. But there's kind of like this shift back into that, and then it kind of goes out and becomes infinite. And it's kind of like you're kind of out here in this infinite, experiencing through this body, but uh, but from a, a way but back there. Predominantly there. Yeah, it's much more back there. Yeah. And it depends on how great the contract is, contrast is, because I said it, as we talked about, some people have a much more mild shift, and so it kind of goes much more slowly or quiet, quietly. Um, we shift from from experiencing ourselves as being the doer, and you know, and and. Uh, the, the actor in the world to, to observing, uh, witnessing the doing going on. Uh, there is a, a often times a sense of freedom or liberation uh, from our, because it's like we were in this little box and uh, suddenly we're out of the box and we're in this much bigger place because the ego is, you know, a very small thing, tiny kind of set of little concepts and we play these kind of roles in our life uh, you know, act, acting out these things as the parent and the friend and the and the worker and all these kind of little roles we have and our concepts about what that's supposed to look like and so on. And you step out of that and it's a huge uh, relief and liberation. Um, as it as it gets uh, established uh, and deeper, you settle into um, what's what's commonly called nirvana or satchitananda absolute bliss consciousness. So there's the, there's the sense of being this consciousness, but that consciousness is awake and um, I'll be talking at the sand about, about the koshas as, as I mentioned, and uh, there's kind of like our usual experience of life, we're living in the physical, emotional, mental bodies. That's where we're dominantly in. But after the, the clear awakening and it becomes established, we're living in the top three, consciousness, uh, the Chittamaya, the, the, the chit field, and the bliss body. So Sat Chit Ananda. And uh, we're, sort of living, we're still living in the body as well in, in that sense, but who we are is kind of outside that in the, in the upper three koshas. And uh, uh, so it's kind of this, this flip in, in where we are. So it's a very different experience of the world. There may be that sense we talked about before of the world that becomes, gains a sense of illusoriness. Uh, uh, it, that can be really strong, or it can be very slight, and just like, oh, this isn't as, doesn't seem as solid as it used to. Um, uh, or, it could, or like I say, it could be really, you know, like the world is meaningless, and it's nothing, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, there could be, yeah, sometimes for some people there's no real change um, in, the, in their life itself, and for others, uh, various things change. It kind of it varies. Uh, like in my own case, a whole bunch of things fell out of my fell out of my life beforehand, and uh, was basically set the stage for the shift to happen. In um, whereas another friend of mine is living unity now. Um, he works multiple businesses. He's he's gotten more busy, and more creative, more uh, active in all kinds of ways. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, huge variations. There's no, there's no way of, you know, knowing how your specific unfolding is going to take. Okay, place. so that's cosmic consciousness. That's cosmic consciousness, and then from there, the consciousness kind of wakes from itself in the world. And a lot of people these days are going straight into unity, 
And so there's a shift from experiencing myself here to experiencing uh, myself as, it's kind of like you become the container of everything. Mm -hmm. And so all of this is within myself. Mm -hmm. There's no longer an inside and an outside. There's a, it's not necessarily very conscious, but there's usually a distinct experience of this is in, in me, you know, these are my emotions, my thoughts, uh, and so on. They're, they're inside here and outside is separate. Whereas with the unity shift, those two become one, and so there's no longer inside and outside. It's just a, kind of a continuum. And this is all inside too. I mean, there's another way of framing it. It's all inside. <laughs> Although there, usually there's a progression with that. And so because of that, there's a, it's a profoundly different relationship with the world and everything becomes very intimate. It can also take on a reality um, where, because you are, you are you know, infinite consciousness and this couch is infinite consciousness and it's myself, the world can actually become more concrete than it ever was before because it is absolute. Not changing. Uh, not changing yeah. in, in an appearance. Indestructible. Yeah, but in an appearance. Uh -huh. And so the, the, so the surface value, which may have seemed illusory, can then take on this, this sense of reality, mm. not because of its appearance, but because it's all just consciousness, right. or all just absolute being. No, that to be indeed yeah. indestructible by which all this is pervaded. Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting, it was, you know, when that showed up here, it was the interesting yeah. thing. So there's a, and there's a whole series of, and, and sometimes the unity just talked about is coming in stages. So if there is a sufficient refinement going on, um, and you know, it's worth noting, um, Ayurveda has this idea of the six bhavas. When we're born into this life, we bring in these the six so areas. Three of them relate to um, our bloodline, mm -hmm. mother's line, father's line, and nutrition during pregnancy. Um, the, the other three relate to what we bring forward from prior lifetimes mm -hmm. and other, other bodies and other bloodlines. Not always, but usually other bloodlines. Um, and uh, two of those are Atman and Sattva. So essentially what it means is development of consciousness, development of refinement is cumulative. Mm -hmm. So what development o we make... Over is, lifetimes. Yes. So what, what we develop in the prior lifetime, we bring forward into this life, and we build, we build on it from there. Mm -hmm. And so this is why you see people coming in and, and basically waking up just about, you know, without any real practice, yeah. and, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, or uh, spontaneously out of nowhere. And you see other people, you know, cranking away for years with, their, with good practices and, and not really making a lot of progress, apparently. But they're still they're building their their right. uh, their or their bank account, you could say, mm -hmm. um, and so it's a mixture there. So so if there is a sufficient refinement and we continue in that process, then uh, then a God consciousness stage unfolds, and essentially what that means is the perception refines. We become aware of those layers between the physical and the and the, the uh, consciousness, and now I mean, and it's not just on a like we, we all experience our emotions, but we also can experience that level of reality in the world. We can experience the flows of energy, uh, the you know prana and, and those kind of dynamics. Um, uh, you know, people talk about auras, and, and there's kind of different layers of of because uh, the, the kosha means sheath. So essentially, we have our physical body, the anamaya, which basically means the food body, and then we have the the energy body, which uh, is a little bit bigger. So it immer it, we're immersed in the energy body, it, it, pen it fully penetrates the physical body, but it sticks out a little bit around the body. Mm -hmm. So people can see that a little bit, you know, by the, you know, kind of it sticks out a little bit. And then the mental body is a little bit bigger again, a little, but it's a little more subtle, a little bit more uh, generalized, less specific, and then, and so on, going out until consciousness is essentially infinite. So it's, it's, uh, so with God consciousness, so with God consciousness, why yeah. is the God word in there? So, so okay, so basically, <laughs> there's this this refinement of perception of those layers become apparent. The heart uh, awakens, the uh, pradaya mahamarma, and um, and it leads that refinement leads us to become aware of the doer doers. The, the, those devata, mm -hmm. and again, if the heart awakens, then they're, they're, they're the capacity to experience them as beings uh, arises also. And um, 
or it's tied into that anyways. And, uh, or we may be more, you know, the scientist orientation, more heavily leaning on the intellect. And we can, you know, go into the, the refine and, and experience them in as principles and, and functions, you know, looking at geometry and, and fields and, and that kind of thing, depending on how we experience. Because people also have a dominant sense. I'm very visual. I see stuff. Uh, some people are more uh, auditory. Like feel things or, or they're more auditory or mm -hmm. whatever like that. They experience it in different ways. They hear vibrations, uh, music of the spheres, or, or they feel uh, the layers. They can kind of feel the layers in the body and having different kind of uh, densities and consistencies and different kinds of flows and so on like that. Uh, different styles of that. And so once you become aware of these, these refined values, especially when you get down into celestial perception around the bliss body and so on, then you start to experience uh, forms of the divine itself uh, in acting in the world and so on. Yeah, as gods. Yeah, yeah angels. Well, people would call it gods. Well, angels are a little more gross, but, mm -hmm. but at that level it's more like, like I mentioned in the first interview about experiencing Krishna, for example, mm -hmm. and, uh, and later on Christ and so on. Um, there's been a bunch of them. Um, and uh, and, and, and to me, from, from my perspective, I find it really handy because you can experience them both ways. It's kind of like a shift of focus or a shift of orientation to go from the intellect to the heart mm -hmm. and then shift orientation to the, uh, the world around us. And, uh, and then you can see, you know, for example, you know, if I'm in a plane and it's, so it's really rough, you know, there's turbulence. a lot of turbulence, I can have a conversation with a, with the, the, bayous the, the yeah the, the wind the wind the deus and, and ask them to you know if they could move off a little interesting and um, and sometimes I have to you have to kind of go up the ladder and you have to be very respectful and stuff yeah. um, because you know they're being told to do something so they're doing it you know yeah. uh, but you know you go up the ladder a little bit and and you express respect and so on and you can have this yeah that's an interesting point I mean some people think that sounds kooky oh it does. I mean I, yeah. I mean if you, 20 years ago, well, maybe not more than that now, but at one point in my life, if, if I heard myself saying something like this, it's like, oh my God. I mean, by the, <laughs> in that same vein, there must be devas involved in volcanoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and all those things. Yeah. Um, and theoretically, which kind of like... And actually, that, that ties into what we were talking about earlier on as well, because uh, this, when we're uh, building up, when we're in, in suffering, we're caught in our stuff. Um, Sometimes people repress it, and sometimes people kind of spew out and you know yeah. into the environment. And that stuff, if if it's not being processed, it retains our energy signature, so we, we don't kind of it doesn't go away in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it um, but as it builds up in the environment, at a certain point, it has to release in some way. Yeah. And so nature will that it's one of the, the things that motivates um, riots and natural disasters. Wars. And kind of wars. Yeah. yeah, is this buildup of stress in the environment. And it, and it, so if we can alleviate that through uh, enough people being awake and, and so on, yeah. and through you know, uh, working with the devas in such a way that they help, help with that kind of thing, then uh, we can, yeah. like my friend that works on Washington. Right. <laughs> He's not doing such a good job. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who knows? But you know, I mean, if, if he wasn't working on it, who knows if yeah, it right. works? <laughs> uh, we'll see. Well, that's kind of fascinating. I mean, because you know, people would say, okay, earthquakes, tectonic plates, or hurricanes, oh, sure. you know, well, um, pressure variations, or whatever causes or hurricanes, and um, you know, sure, sure, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. there, there is that. There is, there is the physical mechanics. Certainly, yeah. that's not. I don't uh, object to that. But what's actually driving that? Yeah. It's yeah. You can say. Well, you can say that. Oh, this, this, the, the. Uh, there's the pressure under the earth, and and that kind of sure. But part of the part of the dynamics. If you, if you look at the energy, um, or you feel it, or whatever like that in an environment, you, I mean, you can go into uh, someone's house to visit, and you can feel that sometimes there's been a big fight, or it's like real kind of, ugh, you don't want to be there, it's yeah, yeah. Not like that. It's kind of like that on a larger scale. There, there's places you can go, and it just feels nasty. Yeah. And at some point, that energy has to resolve. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, you make a very important point here, really, if, which is if this is true, if this is the way things work, then wars, um, of which there have been far too many, are not ultimately caused by political differences or religious differences or anything like that. They're caused by a buildup of impurity or stress in collective consciousness and uh, can be 
defused by the dissolution of that impurity or stress if if we can actually accomplish yeah. doing that. Yeah, it's all, but uh, I would add in it's also caused by um, uh, ways people are relating to the world, what kind of what kind of things they're supporting, mm. because it's it's also driven by people who, you know, are motivated by power and, and uh, yeah. that kind of. But 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 the buildup of stress gives them an opportunity to move in. Well, yeah, and also if there's if it's true that there's sort of Asuric and Davic forces kind of um, yeah. playing tug of war with one another which is literally depicted in the Vedas, you know, that yeah. snake on the mountain, um, then certain people are aligned with one camp and certain people are aligned with the other. Yeah. And, yeah. and those aligned with the, sort of the Asuric camp are, are you know, more consumed by greed and promoting their own agenda regardless of the consequences and yeah. stuff like that. And not recognizing there will be consequences. Yeah, yeah. Which there will be. Huh. <laughs> but yeah. that's actually an interesting dynamic too because if, if you know, when, when you're smooth and you do something that's not so good, you see the result quickly. Yeah, you get smacked. Yeah, and whereas uh, when if you you don't you're not seeing consequences, it actually indicates there's a backlog, and so there's more of a time delay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Although it's complicated because there's different layers of that and different areas of life where we're you know we might be have some emotional stuff we haven't dealt with, but we're kind of clean more clean on the mental level, or we might have a bunch of mental identifications and be a little cleaner in another, some other area of life, you know, it, it, mm. is, it really is a little different that way. But nonetheless, it, it's um, it, one of the reasons people don't recognize the consequences is because they've got a backlog. That's, yeah. So there's a time delay in there. Yeah. We try to teach our children about that because they don't recognize the, con the consequences of some of their the things they do, like stick your finger on a, in, a, in a fire, it's going to hurt. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. All right, so we've kind of meandered into a number of little points here, uh, yeah. which are profound and significant, but is there something you could say by way of a wrap-up that would you know, be a nice conclusion to this whole conversation? Hmm. Uh, good point. Um, well, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess the, I, I, personally, I'm really inspired by what's going on, watching so many people wake up. Uh, because I've been writing about this online for over a decade, uh, I get a lot of contact from people and that, that have woken up and they, they're trying to understand how to support it. Um, or they're, they're, they're thanking me because they didn't have language. And, you know, so I, there's some language there that they can use to... Because to, the mind has to digest the experience for it to be integrated. And if there's no language, it's very difficult for that to take place. And uh, and just seeing the processes happening and the people I know who are quite awake and the the these uh, devas waking up and the, and the divine sutras coming out and the, uh, the the you know people are going through stages now that that you know we hadn't even heard of back in not so long ago and uh, and there's profound shifts going on now the 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 issue though is understanding that dynamic because when consciousness rises, it pushes what hasn't been resolved to the surface. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing a lot in the world right now is some things may seem to be getting worse. Uh, if you look at statistics, they're actually getting better, like mm -hmm. crime rates, murder rates, uh, all, you know. Yeah, who uh, is it? Health, Steven Pinker or somebody uh, who writes about that? There's a whole, yeah, a whole lot of good stuff me, going on. Yeah, somebody sent me a thing on, yeah. on Vox.com recently, and it, it's just like this long list of statistics about, you know, child uh, infant mortality rates are going way down, and, and the people's wealth around the world are going way down, and up, uh, or up rather, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and all these markers of, of, of things are improving. But if you look at the news, it, you know, it's like, well, oh, hell's breaking. Yeah, it's yeah, almost like yeah. both are happening at the same time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and so it's pushing this stuff to the surface. But if you understand that that's what's going on, it's there to be seen and recognized and cleared. So the, the you know the way that uh, uh, men in power have been treating women, for example, um, that's been going on for a long time. We wouldn't talk about it. Now it's coming to the surface and and it's being adjusted to be seen and and coming to more. We can have the opportunity to go to a more balanced place about that and and uh, have more appropriate uh, relationships and uh, professionally, you know, in, in those kind of fields and so on. Um, and 
and all these things are, are there as a process to, to help purify. But if we see it as a growing problem and we get invested in, in, in it in a way, um, then we're actually amplifying it. Um, and uh, so it's kind of important we recognize what the dynamics. It's like when you're, you're trying to let go of something, if you grab onto it uh, harder, it doesn't help it go away. Um, it's like the idea of being anti-war versus pro-peace. Anti-war basically amplifies war, mm -hmm. whereas pro-peace amplifies peace. What you put your attention on goes stronger. So it, it's uh, understanding the dynamics of how that works is very important in the current time. So we don't enable the, the uh, issues that are coming to the surface, but rather we help to uh, heal them. Yeah, our friend here was just telling me about up in Portland, the Antifa, I guess they're called, which is some kind of far left radical group. And then the Proud Boys, which is a far right radical group, are kind of clashing with each other. And um, it's, I don't know where I was going with that, but you know, just yeah. the, the polarities. If you really want to be, to introduce something good into society, um, taking a, a radically, a radical and even violent stance against the things you don't like right. uh, is probably going to be counterproductive yeah. as opposed to just injecting the second element of what you actually want to see happen. Or was it that somebody said, be the change we want to see in the yeah, world? Yeah, and, and it's interesting, even energetically, I remember going to this energy workshop some years ago and they, they showed us, we got we paired off and, and they like, one person was really angry and then you monitored your state with that. Uh -huh. And if you resisted the anger, it amplified. They got ang more angry, <laughs> and you felt the anger more. Whereas if you were transparent to the anger, and just allowed the anger, it would basically just go through and it would dissipate. Yeah, I and experienced they would, that they with would, my wife. Right? Yeah. They, and they would like, lose their anger. <laughs> and, and, it, it, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yeah, it would, it, would, it would dissipate. So it's just like how we are with this stuff makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's not, so it's not, it's not about what's happening, it's about how we are with it that makes the, the huge difference. Huh. And becoming more conscious of our own internal dynamics, that helps us become conscious of where we're resisting and, and you know, um, and holding on and that allows us to go in there and, and try and heal and, and, uh, and, uh, and because, you know, if it's showing up in your life, it's, if it's out there, it's, it's in here. Mm. Uh, yeah. Great. So, okay. So you have your blog, davidja.ca yeah. and I'll link to it uh, on BatGap and have already linked to it from your previous interview, but I'll also link to it to the, from the page for this interview. And I, I highly recommend that people go there. There's tons of stuff already written. You probably never read it all unless you don't have anything else to do. Yeah, but, but if you sign up for Coming the, up on 2,000 articles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's you sign crazy. up for the uh, email notification, you, <clears throat> you get an email every time he posts a new one. And yeah. I try to read them all uh, just because I always learn something. Yeah. You know? And there's a key post tab that uh, has articles on, in, organized by subject a little bit that kind of explain some of these perspectives, like about the koshas and the stages and things. Yeah. And uh, there's also a media tab where I have some of my previous Interviews talks things. and um, right. back up too. Okay, and then use your book, Our Natural yes. Potential, yeah. which I think people would enjoy reading. All right, I and should have said that. It covers a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about version. today, I guess, I didn't right? name the book. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Our Natural, our natural Potential. potential. Yeah. Um, and I'll have a link to, the, to that on your web page also. Um, so thanks. Well, thank it's you. It's been a good conversation. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you for listening or watching. And um, I'm here at the SAND conference, and I'll be doing some more things while I'm here. And um, I think the next interview I'll be posting. Well, we'll see. I don't even know. I might as well not say it. It could end up in a different order. But there'll, there'll be some nice material coming out uh, over the coming weeks. So well, thanks.